Hello and welcome to our fourth marathon. I'm Alan Gocho, your host of True Crime Man's Dark Imagination. If you enjoy what we do here, please tell your friends and true crime aficionados because they may not know that we exist. Again, we have taken the results of the polls we conducted under the community section of the channel. But before our episode, we're going to recognize some of our subscribers and the list continues to grow and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Donna Puckett, Abigail Antwi, Stuart Hornsey, Jenky Fu, Johnny B. Good Covington, Daniel Casalaro, Robert Lohr, Chin Lo, Andrea Guzman Jimenez, Donna Thompson, Jeanette Dand, Ryan Cheney, Denise Batts, Police 123 CD, Lawrence Kitch, Charlene Thomas, Renee Reed, Nick F., Flower Weevil, Gary Hughes, Ted Bradford II, Sam 130 Trey, Mark Mark, Joe Poltrone, Wayne Bishop, Phil Colmer, That One Guy 22, Helene Gagnon, Teresa Besseril, King of the Ozone, Kristen Milliken, Everett Sani, Deep MS 1983, Gavin Monroe, Jonathan Barber, Gloria Harper, Harry Alec, Bobby Lucas, Mike Mueller, Antonio Bongiovanni, Cesar Suarez, Griselda Sierra, Joe Sporer, Courtney Marks, Rich Golan, Joe Bradley, Zyraline Pomar, Samer Albacour, Carla Alex, a little sound effects, Halo No Official, Tawika Frank, Matt Likens, Marissa Singapore, Wes Nyman, and Mitzi Carpenter. And now, here is our episode on True Crime Man's Dark Imagination, Marathon 4. On May 7, 1896, at the Moyamensing Prison in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the condemned man stood on the scaffold, waiting for the executioner to pull the lever, thus ending his life. He set the record straight, had confessed to the deaths of 27 people, and when the phrase was included in the vocabulary of law enforcement, he became known as the first serial killer in American history. But are the facts that we have come to accept about this despicable individual actually the facts as they occurred? The condemned man waiting for his execution was born Herman Webster Mudgett on May 16, 1861 to parents Levi Morton Mudgett and Theodate Page Price in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Mudgett's parents were the first English immigrants in that area at that time. Webster was the third child, with an older sister, older brother, younger brother, and a younger sister. Raised in a devout Methodist atmosphere, Webster's father worked various occupations such as a farmer, trader, and a house painter. As a young child, some bullies taunted Mudgett to the point of pushing him into a doctor's office where a skeleton hung in the corner of the office. Instead of being frightened, Webster became fascinated with human anatomy. 
Little is known of Webster's childhood, but at the age of 16, he married Clara Lovering Alton, who bore Webster a son on February 3rd, 1880, Robert Lovering Mudgett. At the age of 18, after leaving the University of Vermont, Webster enrolled at the University of Michigan Medical School and worked in the anatomy lab. History records that at the same time, Webster began to violently beat his wife, causing her to leave him in 1884. While attending medical school, Mudgett found money scarce and formulated schemes that brought him enough money to stay in school and pay tuition. One of these schemes involved selling cadavers from the school's coffers. Webster graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School just barely in 1884 and continued selling cadavers. After leaving the college, Webster stole corpses from the anatomy lab in order to perfect a dishonest practice that Webster made an art form for at the time. He would steal the corpses, disfigure them, then claim that he had purchased a life insurance policy on the dead body. Thus, he conned the insurance companies out of money for this fraudulent practice, a practice he continued throughout his adult life. Mudgett had a partner for this insurance scam, and in one instance, he claimed to have a body they could pass off as one of the insureds. The partner backed out, and Mudgett was stuck with the corpse. He stored the body in a barrel where he was living, and when the smell became too great, he buried the corpse in his basement. It would have been a hard sell to authorities had the young doctor been caught with a freshly deceased corpse in a barrel in his room. Also, after graduation, Webster moved to Chicago, Illinois, and began working in the pharmacy industry. At this time, Mudgett decided to use an alias for which history would later condemn him, Dr. Henry H. Holmes. Once he assumed the alias, Holmes engaged in crooked real estate deals, promotional campaigns, and corrupt business operations. Even though Holmes already married in 1880, he later married Murda Z. Belknap in Minneapolis, Minnesota on January 28, 1887. The couple produced a daughter, Lucy Theodate Holmes, born on July 4, 1889 in Englewood, Illinois. The problem? Holmes had now become a bigamist. It appeared that Holmes ignored the law in everything he did, and the family of three lived in an affluent area of Chicago known as Wilmette. Although Holmes produced children, Holmes would never be known as a, quote, family, end quote, man. He tended to his businesses in the city rather than spending quality time with his young family or any other children he sired in the past. He set up a room at his place of employment and very rarely went to visit his family in the suburbs. Holmes filed for divorce from his first wife after marrying the second one but the divorce with Clara never materialized. At this time, Holmes married another woman, Georgiana Yoke, on January 9, 1894. At the same time, Holmes carried on a relationship with the wife of a former employee, Ned Connor. Connor's wife, Julia Smith, became Holmes' lover, although he was still married to other women. During one of his many trips into the city of Chicago, Holmes saw a business opportunity through Dr. E. S. Holton's drugstore. Holmes wrangled his way into a job at the business. Dr. Holton happened to be dying from cancer and his wife took over the store. Holmes managed to convince Mrs. Holton into letting him purchase the store from the Holtons. There was a caveat, however. Holmes had it stipulated in the bill of sale that after the demise of Dr. Holton, Holmes would be allowed to live in the upstairs apartment. After Dr. Holton passed, Holmes took up residence in the upstairs apartment. Although historical records strongly surmise that Holmes murdered Mrs. Holton and then took over the business, we still do not hear anything from Mrs. Holton from the historical record. Holmes informed relatives and friends that Mrs. Holton left unexpectedly to visit relatives in California. Then she decided to live there no one ever really followed up on whether Mrs. Holton did exactly what Holmes related. Holmes then decided to build the ultimate chamber of horrors and make money from others' deaths. 
Across the street from the pharmacy stood a plot of land that convinced Holmes to build a hotel, but not just any hotel. Holmes envisioned a three-story building, naming it, quote, the castle, end quote. Primarily the rooms in the, quote, hotel, end quote, would be built with either soundproof rooms, rooms sealed with airtight atmospheres, or ones that had a, quote, body shoot, end quote, where once persons were murdered, the bodies would be placed in the chute that ended in the basement. Always thinking about making money, Holmes had shops built on the ground floor so that he could collect rents while he murdered aimlessly, possibly collecting life insurance on the deceased, or robbing them of their valuables before murdering them wholesale. Several historians have raised questions as to whether Holmes actually ran the castle as a hotel. Although he may have built the third floor of the castle to function as a hotel, it appeared that this was never actually used as one. Right as the building opened, Holmes' creditors came calling, an almost constant occurrence because Holmes never paid his bills, and repossessed most of the furniture. Even more convincing that Holmes was not the proprietor of a hotel, per se, is that during the course of the World Exposition of 1893, a fire broke out on August 13, 1893, and destroyed the third floor of the castle. The building had to be evacuated but the press never mentioned whether any, quote, hotel guests, end quote, were taken from the building. Although the evidence suggests that the building was not used as a hotel, this would not have been out of character for Holmes, seeing as he relished in coming to the rescue of females and then murdering them. Holmes' plan seemed to go like clockwork. In trying to find architects and builders to bring his plan to fruition, Holmes hired, then fired, builders and contractors as the construction progressed, keeping the secrets of the main purposes of the construction. In turn, bills went unpaid, and several people sued Holmes for the amounts owed on the work already accomplished. Completion of the, quote, castle, end quote, was just in time for the 1893 Chicago World's Exposition. The plans of the castle were very intricate. The upper two floors had Holmes' office and, quote, a maze of well over 100 windowless rooms with doorways that would open to brick walls, oddly angled hallways, stairways to nowhere, doorways that could not be opened from the outside, and a host of other strange and labyrinthine constructions, end quote. Holmes took the extreme advantage of the castle and the fact that the world's exposition would possibly see over 27 million visitors come to the Windy City to gasp at the marvels of modern science and the inventions that would soon cause citizens to embrace the 20th century. Over the next three years, Holmes had his pick of victims amongst the female employees of the premises during construction from the shops on the bottom floor. One of the conditions of their employment was that Holmes took out a life insurance policy on the employees once they started working for him. Holmes paid the premiums and made himself the beneficiary. The life insurance would eventually be paid after Holmes tortured and then killed his prey. Some of his victims suffered from asphyxiation when locked in soundproof and airtight rooms when Holmes released natural gas into the rooms. Near his office, Holmes had installed a soundproof back vault a place where victims would scream, Holmes could hear it, and relish in the agony until the victim died. In order to make more money, Holmes put their bodies down the body chute to the basement, where he dissected, stripped them of all their flesh, wired the bones together to form a skeleton, then sold them to local medical schools. Also installed in the basement, Holmes contracted for two large furnaces to cremate bodies as well, acid pits, bottles of poison, and a stretching rack adorned his chambers in the basement. Because of the misdeeds he conducted during medical school, connections were utilized to sell the skeletons, in addition to organs he procured from some of the bodies. Additionally, being a licensed physician under the name of Mudgett, Holmes performed illegal abortions in one of the more isolated rooms of the castle in the basement. In 1890, Ned Connors and his wife Julia and their daughter Pearl moved into Holmes Wallace Street building. Connors made his living as a jeweler and did quite well for himself, so much so that Holmes offered to sell the building to Connors, 
when Connors purchased the building from Holmes, Holmes did not mention how much debt he had accumulated surrounding the building, and Connors discovered that Holmes and Julia had been having an affair for some time. Connors thought to himself that Holmes wanted to trade the building for his wife. When Connors found out about the affair, he quickly sold the building back to Holmes and then left the city. For months thereafter, people noticed this vibrant young woman and her little girl walking the streets around Wallace Street. Then, one day, Julia and Pearl disappeared. Holmes responded to queries to his neighbors regarding the woman and her child that they moved or went to visit family, never to return or be seen alive again. Soon after the disappearance of Julia and Pearl Connors, Holmes met a young lady that worked not too far from the castle at an alcoholism treatment center where Holmes' new partner, Benjamin Peitzel, took his treatments. Her name was Emmeline Sagrand. Sagrand was a secretary that worked in an office not too far from the castle. Holmes became so enamored with the young girl that he offered to hire her to work for him at double her salary. What young lady in that age would not have jumped at an offer like that? It is not readily apparent as to whether Holmes and Sagrand became intimate right away. Several of the people staying or working in the castle, of course, had their suspicions. At approximately Christmas 1892, a Mrs. Lawrence, one of Holmes' tenants, had a conversation with Sagrand just before she disappeared. Sagrand stated to Lawrence that she was thinking about leaving her job and Chicago. Mrs. Lawrence never saw her again. When Mrs. Lawrence confronted Holmes about where Sagrand had gone to, Holmes stated she married her fiancé, Robert Phelps, and left the city never to return. Just then, Holmes produced a wedding card that appeared typed, as was not the fashion of the time. Most wedding announcements were handwritten. Mrs. Lawrence felt very uneasy due to the fact that she believed that Sagrand would have told her of such a romance, or even said goodbye before allegedly leaving. Later, Holmes produced a newspaper clipping that announced the wedding of Sagrand and Phelps. No one at the time suspected Holmes of any foul play. Mrs. Lawrence, who later testified at Holmes' trial, also related a moment that she witnessed at the castle. One night, Mrs. Lawrence witnessed Holmes, Benjamin Peitzel, and a new Holmes associate, Patrick Quinlan, carrying a trunk down the steps from the third floor of the castle and out of the building. Lawrence then firmly believed that Holmes murdered the young girl and then placed her into the trunk. In the mid-1880s, Holmes began using a different name when he met a woman named Minnie Williams. Known as, quote, Howard Gordon, end quote, Holmes discovered that Minnie Williams stood to inherit a large part of her mother's estate and very soon in the near future. Minnie was described as a, quote, plain, end quote, girl, who could be easily flattered. For Holmes, this, quote, rang the dinner bell, end quote, so to speak, and Holmes pounced. Over some time, Holmes first wooed the young girl, then he gained control over her finances, real estate, and eventually, she signed over the whole fortune to the ne'er-do-well. When Williams moved to Chicago, Holmes insisted they marry, so they did. No record exists regarding this union. When Minnie contacted her older sister, Nanny, to have a reunion in Chicago, Holmes treated the sisters to a day of celebration where he got to meet his new sister-in-law. Nanny was the first of the sisters to disappear unexpectedly. Then, with Minnie and Peitzel to accompany him, Holmes traveled to Fort Worth, Texas to plan the building of another castle there. He planned to use one of Minnie's real estate possessions to build the new, quote, castle, end quote. One of the many myths that has circulated down through history is that Holmes was a prolific serial killer with more than 200 victims to his credit. At the time when some of the murders allegedly occurred, Witnesses could place Holmes several states away. This, of course, has only been corrected fairly recently. Nevertheless, soon after the initial phase of construction ended in Fort Worth, Holmes left the city. One can surmise that both building projects, the Murder Castle in Chicago and the one in Fort Worth, 
served to con banks out of money as Holmes never intended to pay any of it back in the first place. In any case, it appeared as though Minnie never left Texas. Later, when persons would see a female on Holmes' arm, this happened to be Benjamin Peitzel's wife and not Minnie. In all likelihood, Holmes murdered Minnie in Texas and left the body there. Neither Minnie nor Nanny would ever be seen or heard from again. While returning to Chicago, Holmes got arrested in Colorado on fraud charges and spent the remainder of 1893 behind bars. Upon his release in January 1894, Holmes met and married his fourth and final wife, Georgiana Yoke. Again, Holmes changed his name to, quote, Mr. H. M. Howard, end quote, to project some sort of con on Georgiana. He informed his new love interest that his uncle left him vast tracts of land in his will under the condition that he would change his name, thus the, quote, Howard, end quote, moniker. In actuality, the land of which Holmes spoke belonged to Minnie Williams. While Holmes, quote, courted, end quote, Georgiana, Ben Peitzel, his wife Carrie, and their children, Desi, Howard, Nellie, Alice, and Wharton, moved to St. Louis, Missouri, perhaps in search of more lucrative schemes. Later, in 1894, Holmes contacted Peitzel, requesting that the family man purchase a life insurance policy so that Holmes could fake his partner's death, replacing him with a medical cadaver. Peitzel then met Holmes, and the two traveled to Philadelphia. Peitzel told his wife of the plan, which was unusual, because there is no evidence to suggest that he had ever done so before, even with the wildest of money-making schemes. But this time, Holmes planned something diabolical for the man who shared the secrets of his brutal and murderous existence. While Peitzel waited in Philadelphia for Holmes to find a corpse, the boredom and frustration became too much, and he drank until almost passing out. By the time Holmes caught up with Peitzel, the father of five was barely conscious. Holmes actually contributed to Peitzel's inebriation, implying him with more shots of alcohol. When Peitzel lost consciousness, Holmes overdosed his handyman with chloroform. He then tried to make Peitzel's death appear as an accident. First, he used the oil lamp in the room to burn some of Peitzel's hair. Then, he smashed the chloroform bottle on the floor. Holmes blamed an explosion for Peitzel's demise, and the coroner believed his story. In order for Holmes to collect on the life insurance policy that he acquired on Peitzel, he needed a family member to identify the body. Holmes reached out to Carrie Peitzel, Ben's wife, and asked that she journey to Philadelphia and identify the remains of her husband. Carrie Peitzel refused to leave her infant son, and instead sent her 15-year-old daughter Alice to Holmes on a train. That would be the last time Carrie saw her daughter again. Alice felt uneasy about the trip, although her father, quote, worked, end quote, with Holmes for a long period of time, Alice believed there was something suspicious about the doctor and that the rest of the family, including herself, never really knew Holmes. When Alice arrived in Philadelphia, Holmes picked her up at the train station and the two immediately proceeded to the morgue. Covered with only a thin sheet, an attendant pulled back the sheet to reveal a charred, rotting corpse. There was no mistake that Benjamin Peitzel lay on that table after Alice identified the corpse by its teeth. The Fidelity Mutual Insurance paid Carrie Peitzel $7,500, but Holmes mentioned to her that her husband owed him $5,000. Carrie paid Holmes, but the conniver believed the Peitzel family knew too much and had to be taken care of immediately. Although Alice identified the body, Holmes pretended as though Ben Peitzel was still alive and only Holmes knew where he resided. Holmes sent a letter to Carrie Peitzel and requested that she send more of her children to him in Philadelphia. Holmes stated to her that her husband was not dead, but hiding in Cincinnati, Ohio. If the whole Peitzel family were to travel to Cincinnati to visit their supposedly alive patriarch, it may draw suspicion to Holmes' plan. Carrie sent Howard, age 8, and Nellie, aged 11, to join Alice and Holmes in Pennsylvania. 
Carrie and the two remaining children, Desi and the baby Wharton, would wait a while longer before journeying to meet Holmes. One contemporary at the time stated that Holmes suffered from terrible nightmares, but that these nocturnal testimonies never lessened his ability to be cruel and inhumane. Holmes knew, then and there, what needed to be done with the Peitzel children. From September 28th to November 17th, 1894, Holmes had his hands full with navigating three groups of people around so that his plans would not be uncovered. Holmes and Georgiana, the three Peitzel children, and Carrie Peitzel, the baby Wharton, and Desi were being pushed around the Midwest and Canada by Holmes with the hopes that his plans would remain secret. They traveled through the states of Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Toronto, and finally Ogdenburg, New York. Whenever they arrived in a new city, the parties seemed to lose members. Howard Peitzel was the first to disappear. Alice wrote in a letter to her mother that Howard was no longer with them. Observers were not sure as to what Holmes told the children to quit asking about little Howard. Alice Peitzel demonstrated homesickness and held a very low threshold for the cold weather. Later, investigators learned that the homesick girl stayed only three blocks from her mother Carrie Peitzel, Baby Wharton, and Desi. Carrie Peitzel believed that by sending her children ahead of her with Holmes that they would be rejoining their father. In reality, Holmes murdered them not too long after they arrived in a particular city. The distraught wife soon arrived in Vermont and again received more requests from Holmes to send her more of her children. Finally, since Carrie Peitzel all but ignored Holmes' requests, he visited her in person. Holmes planned to murder Carrie through the actions he later documented. When he could not convince her any further to put her children in his care, he went to the basement in which Carrie, Desi, and Wharton had been staying. Later, down in the dank, deep cellar. He dug a large hole. Later, Carrie found a note instructing her to go down to the basement. When she trekked down to the cellar, she found the hole and a small bottle of nitroglycerin next to the hole. Carrie then realized that perhaps her children were not missing, but that Holmes disposed of them and her husband and planned to murder her as well. At this point, Holmes had become increasingly paranoid, believing that he may have been caught at any moment. What he didn't know was that the Fidelity Mutual Insurance Company sent detectives to follow him and the Peitzels for a long time. When the Holmes party crossed the border into Toronto, obviously the jurisdiction of the insurance company investigators ceased. However, once Holmes and the lot re-entered the United States, the investigators were hot onto his trail. After visiting Kerry Peitzel, Holmes journeyed to his hometown, Gilmanton, New Hampshire, where he met with his former wife, Clara, their 15-year-old son, Robert, and Holmes' parents. It has been surmised that Holmes developed an elaborate lie to get back in the good graces of his former wife when he told her that he had been involved in a terrible accident and that he had amnesia. While in the hospital convalescing, the staff informed him that his name was H.H. H. Holmes and that he fell in love with his nurse, Georgiana Yoke, before suddenly remembering that his name was Herman Webster Mudgett. Holmes proved convincing to his former family, and they believed his story. After a few days, Holmes stated he had to tend to some business in Boston and would return shortly. Holmes never returned to New Hampshire. On November 17, 1894, authorities arrested Holmes in Boston and charged him initially with horse theft a crime he may have committed while visiting Texas. But when the insurance investigators caught up to him, the charges began to multiply. Then, Holmes realized he had to weave some tall tales. He stated to police that he and Peitzel developed a scheme to defraud the insurance company, but then Peitzel killed himself. In reorganizing his plan, Holmes stated that he had to make it look like an accident because he knew the insurance company would not pay out for a suicide. After all, Holmes pleaded, he was doing it for Peitzel's family and not for himself. Holmes also claimed that the Peitzel children were still alive and with his wife, Minnie Williams, in London. The police also arrested Carrie Peitzel because she had knowledge of the plan to defraud the insurance company. 
As Holmes and Carrie Peitzel sat in jail cells in Boston, Detective Frank Geyer endeavored to locate the Peitzel children. Detective Geyer and another investigator, Inspector Gary from the Fidelity Insurance Company, combed over hotel records, spoke with the proprietors of boarding houses, and other possible witnesses as to whether they saw Holmes and the children together. Police in Chicago, alerted that the Boston police held Holmes in their custody, began to search Holmes' Englewood building. When police went into the basement, reporters followed closely behind them and caused an explosion when someone's candle ignited an old fuel tank. Soon thereafter, Chicago police uncovered a vat filled with a strange chemical, later discovered to be gasoline, where they assumed Holmes stripped the human bodies of all their flesh. Furthermore, authorities found a scratched up bench that appeared to have been used as a dissecting table. When police found a length of rope in a toolbox that belonged to Patrick Quinlan, they determined that the rope may have been used to hang dead bodies in the elevator shaft. Quinlan steadfastly denied that the rope was used for that purpose. Police also made a rather grisly discovery when they dug deeper in the basement. Human bones doused with quicklime. The coroner determined the bones probably belonged to a child no older than 10 years of age. This discovery convinced authorities that Holmes murdered Pearl Connor, but Holmes merely stated that he buried a rotting corpse. Law enforcement next looked to the basement stove where they uncovered small particles of fabric and a watch chain, which investigators determined belonged to Minnie Williams. Detectives also found what they believed to be, quote, heavily burnt bones, end quote, but closer scrutiny proved that they were just burned pieces of clay and turkey bones. Back east, Inspector Gary and Detective Gray found a house that Holmes rented in Toronto. When they searched the basement, they found a small patch of disturbed earth the two investigators began digging as quickly as possible, and at the bottom of this shallow hole, the detectives found a large trunk, the one that Carrie Peitzel described to them at her arrest. Mrs. Peitzel stated she packed it for the children before they left St. Louis. When Inspector Gary and Detective Geyer opened the chest, they found the bodies of Alice and Desi Peitzel. When Holmes heard that the investigators discovered the chest, he stated, well, I guess they'll hang me for this. Even though Holmes was suspected to be a serial killer, a term that would not be coined until the mid-20th century, people from all over the Chicago area claimed to have worked with him or had personal relationships with him within the time he spent in the, quote, Windy City, end quote. One author noted the entire population of Chicago had, quote, lost its collective mind, end quote, one man, Myron Chapel, claimed that he helped Holmes articulate the corpses to sell to medical schools, which could have implicated Chapel in the disposal of some of the bodies. Later, after police placed a lot of credence in Chapel's story, they discovered that Chapel was a drunk and a liar. The Chicago police became so embarrassed at having believed Chapel, they ceased interrogations altogether or investigations into other locations that Holmes may have stayed. When all was said and done, police found no real tangible evidence to charge Holmes with anything. Back in Ohio, Inspector Gary and Detective Geyer questioned one of Holmes' old neighbors who, quote, recalled a moving wagon arrive at the vacant house next door occupied by a boy a man, an enormous stove, end quote. When whisperings about the man, the boy, and the large stove reached the ears of the man, Holmes, he confronted the neighbor and informed her that he decided he would not take the house and she could keep the stove if she wanted it. Because of the neighbor's suspicion, Holmes abandoned his plans in Ohio. In Indianapolis, Inspector Gary and Detective Geyer located another house that he rented there and discovered that Holmes had purchased an identical stove to the one he left behind at the Ohio residence. But in this stove, the persistent investigators found some burnt clothes, photographs, human teeth, and, quote, the top of a skull belonging to a prepubescent boy, end quote. 
Later, these fragments would join Ben Peitzel's skull underneath the desk of the man that would later prosecute Holmes. Inspector Gary and Detective Geyer knew they had enough evidence to prosecute Holmes for murder, so they brought their findings to the district attorney who, in turn, filed charges against H.H. H. Holmes for the Peitzel murders. Always trying to show his intelligence, Holmes decided to write his autobiography from prison. He did this in the hopes that he could garner some sympathy from the jury. Although the prosecution had ample time to prepare, the defense team only had a month. Eventually, they quit and Holmes decided to defend himself. People in the gallery marveled at Holmes' prowess in the courtroom. Perhaps he gained a lot of practice with the endless lawsuits he seemed to either ignore or fail to appear altogether. In the end, though, his attorneys returned, but it was the emotionally charged testimony of Kerry Peitzel that brought the, quote, whole courtroom to tears, end quote. Finding that Georgiana Yoke and Holmes were never legally married, the judge allowed her testimony against Holmes to be admitted into the record. For the first time, perhaps as an effect to influence the jury, Holmes broke down in tears when Yoke testified against him. Even though the evidence against him in the murder of Benjamin Peitzel proved circumstantial at best, his attorneys successfully argued that the incidents in Chicago had no bearing on the trial in Philadelphia. The jury convicted Holmes. Subsequent to this conviction, Holmes confessed to over 27 other murders, and then the legend began. Popular newspapers, such as William Randolph Hearst's New York World, known for the, quote, yellow journalism, end quote, perpetrated later that stoked the fire for the U.S. entering the Spanish-American War in 1898, printed the rumors about Holmes as fact. The newspaper eventually began a long association with the convicted murderer, providing him with a column and eventually paying him $7,500 for his full confession. Later investigation of Holmes' quote, confession, end quote, revealed that some of the 27 people he claimed to have murdered were still alive at the time of his trial and death. Some speculated that Holmes confessed for such a large sum believed to his wives and children. No one really believed that Holmes could be that altruistic. A more likely explanation was that he prepared for an appeal, and appeals are and were expensive. Holmes was reported to have claimed, I was born with the evil standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world, and he has been with me ever since. But some researchers doubt these as Holmes' factual words. Even though Holmes hoped that an appeal would bring him a new trial, his options quickly ran out. Finally, on May 7th, 1896, Holmes was hanged at Moyamensing Prison in Philadelphia. The convicted murderer requested that his body be buried under concrete so that no harm would come to his corpse. Over the next 125 years, the Holmes legend grew to the point where the facts became lost in the resurgence of the gore. Many of the legends surrounding Holmes have since been disproven. For example, the fact that Holmes cheated death proved untrue as in 2017, Janet Monge of the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology exhumed Holmes' body to determine if he actually cheated death. Monge concluded through dental records that the man buried within Holmes' grave was, in fact, Herman Webster Mudgett, a.k.a. H.H. H. Holmes. After Holmes' death, rumors began to circulate that he cursed those that captured and eventually convicted him. Dr. William K. Martin, coroner's physician who had been a major witness against Holmes at the trial, died suddenly from blood poisoning shortly after Holmes' body was buried. Michael Arnold, the trial judge, and lead coroner, Dr. Ashbridge, both contracted deadly illnesses and succumbed a short time later. Howard Perkins, the prison superintendent at Moyamensing, where Holmes spent his final days and who presided over Holmes' execution, committed suicide by shooting himself in the head. Then, the father of one of Holmes' victims was horribly burned in a gas explosion, and the remarkably healthy Frank Geyer 
suddenly became ill. Detective Geyer subsequently overcame his illness and survived. After those deaths, the office of the claims manager for the insurance company that Holmes had cheated caught fire and burned. Everything in the office was destroyed except for a framed copy of Holmes' arrest warrant and two portraits of the killer. Mrs. Anna Harvey of Chicago, who lived in the murder castle, committed suicide. The fiancé of Holmes' lawyer, Samuel P. Rotan, died suddenly. A priest who had prayed with Holmes before his execution was found dead in the church courtyard. The coroner ruled the death as uremic poisoning, but according to reports, his body was found badly beaten and robbed. The jury foreman, Linford L. Biles, was electrocuted in a strange accident involving power lines above his house. Blanche Lamont, a young, vivacious 20-year-old woman, taught school in a one-room facility in Hecla, Montana. Lamont thought her opportunities would be better if she advanced her education. Therefore, she moved to San Francisco, California to attend the normal school and Lowell High while living with her aunt, Miss Trifenia Noble, on 21st Street in the Mission District. On April 3, 1895, at approximately 10 a.m., Blanche rode the Polk Street trolley, and she met a young man who rode with her on the cable car until they reached 21st Street. Other witnesses who observed Blanche and the young man noticed that they were very close as they conversed. The young man took to whispering in the young woman's ear and tapping her on her gloved hands. When they got off their stop at 21st Street, they went their separate ways, Blanche to the normal school and the young man to an undisclosed location. The young man later visited the noble's house and brought a book with him, but then informed Noble that Blanche may have been kidnapped and sold into prostitution. Noble thought this rather odd. A few days later, the young man, later identified as William Henry Theodore Durant, traveled to the Tenderloin District and tried to pawn some golden rings that allegedly belonged to Blanche. Police subsequently questioned Durant due to the fact that he may have been the last person to see Blanche. Durant stated that gangs operated in the area and perhaps they, quote, shanghaied, end quote, Blanche for sale into white slavery. When police shallowly examined Durant's background, they noticed some immoral suggestions made by a female churchgoer who witnessed Durant nude in the church library. But police dismissed these accusations as merely gossip. However, it did make for an interesting investigation at the time. Considering the time period in which this occurred, Appearing nude in a church was scandalous, but the police realized that they possessed no evidence, no body, or any other indications that Blanche was nothing but missing, and would remain that way, even if it was just for a short while. What authorities later learned about Durant exposed a wolf in sheep's clothing. Durant was not a stranger to those who attended the Emmanuel Baptist Church, as he and his family were members there. At the time of Blanche's disappearance, he courted a young 21-year-old named Minnie Flora Williams, also a member of the Emanuel Baptist Church. On Good Friday, April 12, 1895, nine days after Blanche disappeared, Minnie Williams told some friends at her boarding house that she needed to attend a church meeting at the house of one of the elders named Vogel. Vogel's wife witnessed Durant walking with Blanche Lamont on the day she disappeared. At approximately 7 p.m. that evening, Witnesses noticed Minnie Williams and Durant arguing violently in front of the church. A passerby named Hodgkins stopped to intervene in the fray and later stated that the manner in which Durant acted in front of him and Minnie was not the behavior of a gentleman. Minnie and Durant entered the church. At approximately 9 p.m. that evening, Durant walked into the church elders Easter Sunday. One of the ladies went to the cabinet inside the vestibule and stumbled upon a ghastly scene. Inside the cabinet where drinking cups had been stored, 
the lady found the mutilated body of whom police later identified as Minnie Williams. After calling another member of the women's committee to witness what she found, the police were called and immediately they searched for Blanche Lamont. After an in-depth search of the areas of the Emmanuel Baptist Church that lasted most of that Saturday, someone remembered that they had not searched the belfry of the church. As soon as police reached the belfry, they found the lifeless body of Blanche Lamont, her body nude, mutilated, with her head between two boards. Immediately after listening to witnesses who last saw the young ladies with a particular young man, the police searched in earnest to find Theodore Durant. A more intense examining of the background of William Henry Theodore Durant deemed him something of a good catch to ladies of the period. Durant was born in 1871 in Toronto, Canada to William Durant, who made his living as a shoemaker, and his wife Isabella Hutchinson Durant. In 1879, William Durant decided to move the family to the United States, San Francisco, California specifically. Durant had a younger sibling named Beulah Maud Durant, who was born in 1873 and later changed her name to Maud Allen becoming a moderately successful actress in her time. Durant's early life is somewhat of an historical mystery, but when he reached the age where he could continue his education, Durant attended the Cooper Medical College, as was considered by those that knew him at the time as, quote, a mild-mannered, pleasant youth who was the soul of propriety, a much-respected church worker, and a bright medical student, end quote. Durant told people that he saw himself as a successful doctor in the future. He was also considered to be a good young man among the members of the Emmanuel Baptist Church. At the church, Durant worked as an usher, was the assistant Sunday school teacher, and worked as a handyman around the church when small repairs needed attention. When he heard that the police may have been looking for him to question the young man about the two women, he immediately left the vicinity and joined the Signal Corps, where the police eventually located him, but apprehended him the next day and brought him to the police station for questioning. Upon arriving at the station, Durant, at first, denied any wrongdoing, but authorities felt they had their man and charged Durant with the premeditated first-degree murder of both Blanche Lamont and Minnie Williams. Prior to Durant's indictment, news of the murder spread quickly and nationally. When the victims had been embalmed and placed into their coffins, crowds gathered for blocks to parade past the funeral home where Blanche Lamont and Minnie Williams would later be waked. The media saw the opportunity to sell newspapers, and questions arose later as to whether Durant could get an unbiased jury or a fair trial. But eventually, any concerns dissipated as people from around California, and the nation for that matter, searched for the truth of what occurred to these two beautiful, promising women. One observer surmised that the reason why this case became so famous, or infamous, is the portrayal of Durant by the people that knew him, the young, promising medical student who was a devout churchgoer and did anything to help his fellow man, versus the result of a sexual, homicidal maniac as portrayed by the media and the police. Soon, everyone would know the truth and understood that appearances can be deceiving and deadly. Police theorized as to what happened on that April morning in 1895 when Durant met Blanche Lamont on the trolley car as the two headed to their respective schools. The two were quickly noticed by the other riders on the vehicle as Durant whispered into Blanche's ear and tapped her gloved hands. She never really acknowledged Durant's presence except to gently tilt her head with his whispers. Blanche stared ahead most of the time. Durant made plans with the young lady to meet her later at the Emanuel Baptist Church, but neither of them had religion on their mind. At the time, young people made it fashionable for them to meet in churches, who left their doors open to meet for, quote, clandestine sexual rendezvous in empty church rooms, end quote. At approximately 2 p.m. on the afternoon of April 3, 1895, Durant and Blanche met once again and one witness noticed that Durant appeared to be in a hurry to meet Blanche at the church. Mrs. Carolyn Leake witnessed Durant open the heavy oak door to the church so that Blanche could walk through the jam. Three hours later, choir director George King made his way to the organ for practice 
and was startled somewhat when he saw a disheveled Durant approach him. Durant stated he had been fixing some gas jets upstairs in the belfry. King noted that Durant requested the choir director go to the local drugstore and get him some Bromo seltzer. King complied, and when he returned to the church, Durant appeared as though some color returned to his face. Then he strolled out of the church into the cool evening air. Investigators further concluded that once Durant and Blanche made their way into the church, the belfry seemed like the perfect place for a rendezvous. The two then went to the belfry, had sexual relations, and then laid on the belfry floor. Authorities also speculated that, from the way the body was discovered, it appeared that the top bodice of her dress had been ripped open by the killer in order to ensure that the knife he used penetrated her flesh. Investigators also suspected that when Blanche Lamont's body was discovered in the belfry, Durant placed her head between two blocks of wood, a technique that Durant would have learned in medical school, then folded her arms over her chest as if he prepared the body for burial. It appeared that Durant may have had sex with Blanche Lamont again after her death. Durant, after completing his grisly work, left the belfry through a seldom used trap door. Durant returned to the church that evening for services and saw Mrs. Trifenia Noble, Blanche's aunt, and asked her where she may have been. Mrs. Noble stated that she had hoped that Blanche would have made it to the services that evening. Durant mentioned that he brought a book for the young woman to read, but would later drop it off at Mrs. Noble's house. Mrs. Noble ended the conversation by stating that Blanche did not return home from school that day. Her worry intensified over the next few days. Mrs. Noble waited a whole three days before she addressed her concerns with the local police department. Durant immediately fell under the suspicion of authorities as he may have been the last person to see Blanche alive. Police later learned that Durant often bragged about his sexual prowess in the brothels of Carson City, Nevada. In fact, he once bragged to some classmates that he raped an Indian woman. Authorities already dismissed the notion that Blanche Lamont had been kidnapped and sold into white slavery. Police also learned that Durant tried to convince Mrs. Noble of this fallacy, but knowing the young girl's reputation, even though she may have met Durant for a sexual rendezvous, Noble hardly thought the suggestion plausible. Additionally, the attempt to sell the gold rings at a pawn shop stuck out as very strange to investigators. In their minds, Durant tried to eliminate evidence of his complicity in the murder of Blanche Lamont. Before the discovery of Blanche Lamont's body, Durant already set his sights on another beautiful young woman, Miss Minnie Williams, 21 years old. On Good Friday, April 12, 1895, at approximately 7 p.m. that evening, Minnie bade her fellow boarders goodbye and left for a meeting with a church elder. A few minutes later, a witness observed Minnie giving a sharp rebuke to Durant in front of the Emanuel Baptist Church. Later that evening, Durant appeared at the home of Miss Mary Vogel, whose husband was in charge of the church fellowship meeting, and one of the witnesses that saw Durant with Blanche Lamont in front of the church. Vogel noticed that Durant appeared shaken and stated that before joining the meeting, he had to wash his hands. By the time the meeting adjourned, Durant exhibited no visible signs of distress as when he first entered the meeting. Before leaving the meeting, however, at approximately midnight, Durant stated loud enough for everyone to hear that he had to return to the church at that late hour because he left something. On the morning of Saturday, April 13, 1895, since Durant became a member of the Signal Corps, he left for a bivouac on Mount Diablo. On that following Easter Sunday, Minnie Williams' body was discovered when the Ladies' Society prepared for the Sunday services. When police arrived and viewed the body, they witnessed that her wrists had been slashed, her breasts stabbed repeatedly, and her undergarments forced down her throat. Blood dripped to the bottom of the cupboard and leaked onto the library floor. Upon examination by an alienist, notes reflected that the, the cuts, cuts on Minnie's arms were so deep that not only had the monster cut her arteries, but the tendons had been severed as well. The stab wounds to her breasts were made with a dull table knife. After the discovery of Minnie's corpse, newspapers goaded the authorities to search the church further for any other clues as to where Blanche Lamont may be, seeing as Durant had a connection with both women. 
When searching the church again, as they made their way to the belfry, the police noted the smell of decay and flies overpopulating the area. Blanche's body appeared bloated and her face was fearfully distorted, the mouth being open, exposing the pearly teeth and attesting to the terrible death the girl had died. At the end of that day, a San Francisco detective apprehended Durant at Mount Diablo and placed him under arrest. The case of the State of California versus William Henry Theodore Durant began during the first two weeks of October and went into the early part of November, 1895. Even though Durant stood to be executed if convicted of the two murders, he still drew the admiration from young women all over the West. A young blonde-haired woman even brought Durant a bouquet of flowers every morning. Durant continued to protest his innocence and sat in the courtroom every day listening to the mostly circumstantial evidence against him. But as he sat motionless and cool within the confines of the courthouse, Durant's actions on the days of the murders became quite clear with the testimony presented in the state's case. Defense attorneys stated that Durant did not have any blood on his clothing, but common sense dictated that he must have disposed of the clothing prior to leaving for bivouac. Moreover, Defense attorneys sought to shift suspicion away from their client and named Reverend John George Gibson, who spent hours in the church by himself as the murderer. The prosecution averred that Durant sustained no blood spatter because at the time of the murders and after sexual intercourse, he was naked and all he had to do was wash to eliminate any blood stains. After an examination by psychologists, they labeled Durant as, quote, a moral idiot, end quote but never characterized the accused murderer as being insane. Rather, they portrayed the defendant as being morally defective. It turned out that the jury needed no psychological analysis to determine whether Durant capable of such crimes as the murders of Blanche Lamont and Minnie Williams. Throughout the defense's case, they merely stated that Durant was not responsible for the murder of the two young women, and presented no evidence that the defendant may have suffered from a temporary psychosis that forced him to murder them. The prosecution presented more witnesses that Minnie Williams stated she knew more about Blanche's disappearance than she let on. Was Minnie murdered due to her alleged knowledge about Blanche's disappearance? After a lengthy trial that lasted until November of 1895, the jury received their instructions and deliberated for a whole five minutes before returning a verdict of guilty against the defendant, William Henry Theodore Durant, and the judge pronounced the death sentence as punishment. Even throughout the appeals process, Durant's attorneys gave excuses for Durant's behavior from the jaunts on the Barbary Coast, the sordid sexual advances, and drunken debauchery that Durant concealed from the church members. On the morning of January 7, 1898, the day of Durant's execution. He refused to confess to a priest because he professed his innocence again, even at the day of his death. In fact, the condemned man blamed the newspapers for his conviction. Led to the gallows at San Quentin Penitentiary, his arms strapped to his side. Once the executioner placed a white hood over his head and situated Durant over the trap door, he began a long soliloquy from under the hood, his words slightly muffled regarding why he should not have been convicted and that he was innocent. He paused for a brief moment when the executioner placed the noose around his neck and tightened the knot. With the order for his execution read one last time, Durant was in mid-sentence when the executioner pulled the lever, releasing the trap door. Observers noted that they heard Durant's neck snap and his lifeless body hung there for several minutes. His blue eyes, which some people claimed were pale to the point of glassiness, bulged from his face, and his blackened tongue protruded from between his lips. Strangely, when Durant's body was placed in a black lacquer coffin after the execution, his parents sat in an anteroom off the location where the execution took place, eating lunch as the dead body of their son lay in his coffin. When prison officials withdrew from the room to give some time alone with their son, one of the officials overheard Mrs. Durant say, Please, Papa, give me a little more roast. As a result of Durant's reputation and the fact that the population of California, and the rest of the country for that matter, reviled the murderer, no cemetery would accept his remains. 
Durant's parents then took the body, had it cremated, and spread the ashes at an undisclosed location in Los Angeles, California. In September of 1934, a woman's torso with the thighs still attached washed onto the shores of Lake Erie near Cleveland, Ohio. After an analysis of the body, the coroner discovered that the body had been drenched in some sort of chemical that turned, quote, her skin red and textured like leather, end quote. The press then dubbed the corpse as the, quote, Lady of the Lake, end quote. Her head would never be found and therefore authorities were never able to identify her. On September 23, 1935 in Cleveland, Ohio, teenagers walking through Kingsbury Run found the body of a man stripped nude with just a pair of socks. The body had been washed clean and the wrists showed signs of rope burns. His body had the testicles removed. Detectives Emil Musel and Orly May arrived on the scene first and found not one headless body, but two. Police identified one of the bodies as being that of Edward Andrasi, a suspected gay prostitute that worked the areas adjacent to Kingsbury Run. The other corpse sustained the same injuries as Andrasi, but this one would go without being identified. At both crime scenes, little blood existed. The bodies appeared to have been washed, but detectives Musel and May found the missing heads of both corpses. The second corpse demonstrated the same signs as the, quote, Lady of the Lake, end quote, with reference to the chemical drenching of the body. Authorities believed that both men had been dispatched as a result of being killed with either a large knife or an axe. Both corpses sustained incredible wounds and denigration. One detective, Bernard Wood, learned that Andrasi had been visited by a middle-aged man that threatened the former petty criminal to stop seeing his wife or the man would kill Andrasi. For the rest of 1935, the city remained quiet. But in January 1936, authorities discovered the body of a middle-aged woman who the killer placed in two separate baskets near a manufacturing plant. Her body had been disemboweled. Police identified her as middle-aged Florence Palillo, a sex worker in the Cleveland area. Detectives Musel and May did an extensive background check on Palillo to flush any leads as to whom may have committed this grotesque act. What they found led to a very sad story indeed. Neighbors and the woman's landlady told that Palillo was a kind, gentle woman, but was prone to drink and fits of aggressiveness whenever the alcohol was plied. Palillo had a very extensive doll collection, which she allowed her landlady's three daughters to play with when she was home. Moreover, Palillo would engage in abusive relationships with men, which sometimes left her on crutches or with swollen lips or black eyes. At one time, Palillo lived a very pleasant life and when police found her body, they called her ex-husband in Buffalo, New York to come to Cleveland and give a statement to police. It must be noted that Palillo associated with the very dregs of society, pimps, whores, tavern owners, and bootleggers. But when questioned, none of them even knew that Palillo had been murdered. Police later found the rest of her body behind a vacant house and because of the recent cold snap in the city, the cold preserved the parts for analysis. The coroner surmised that because the muscles of her neck had retracted that decapitation was the cause of death. Even with the same signature that allegedly tied the four murders together to one killer, officials were hesitant to state that one killer was responsible for those four deaths. After all, the city prepared for the 1936 Republican Convention and any negative press about the city found its way to the back pages of the newspapers. The mayor at the time, Harold Burton, promised a program that overhauled the police department and the organization of systematic raids on organized crime hangouts promised to clean up the city and provide a positive atmosphere for the citizens in the upcoming convention. Elliot Ness, the treasury agent of Untouchables fame, had been made the director of public safety by Mayor Burton and the city expected big things from such a famous lawman. On June 5, 1936, 
delegates began arriving in the city and placed Ness and his officers on high alert. But on that Friday morning, before the commencement of the convention, police discovered another body. This time, the corpse seemed adorned with tattoos, known thereafter as the, quote, tattooed man, end quote. The victim had been decapitated, but the police recovered the man's head. They made a death mask of the severed head, but no one stepped forward to identify the latest victim. Coroner Arthur J. Pierce estimated that the man had been dead for two days, yet his head had been separated from his body while the victim was still alive. Police officially labeled the unknown victim as, quote, John Doe No. 2, end quote. The victim, found at Morgan Run near East 55th Street, was estimated to be between 20 and 23 years old, light complexion, reddish-brown hair, chestnut-colored eyes, and stood between 5 foot 10 or 5 foot 11 feet tall, slender build, weighed 165 pounds. The victim had several unusual tattoos on his body. One included a bird and band and included the names of, quote, Helen and Paul, end quote, on the inner side of the left forearm. Another tattoo on the outer side of the right forearm was a heart and anchor in red and blue. On the other side was a flag with the initials, quote, WCG, end quote. A butterfly was tattooed on his left shoulder. A head of a comic character, Jiggs, was tattooed on his left leg at the ankle. And, quote, Cupid, end quote, was tattooed on his right leg at the ankle. His underwear bore the laundry mark that identified the person with the initials, quote, JD, end quote. The tattooed man did not appear as the run-of-the-mill hobos in the Kingsbury Run area. His clothing appeared to be newer. He was clean-shaven and well-nourished. Because of the examination of this victim, Dr. Pierce realized a disturbing pattern emerging with the killings. Decapitation is extremely difficult to accomplish. If someone is killing these unfortunates through decapitation only, the victims either had to be sedated or knew their killer. Just before the beginning of the Republican convention, the powers that be in Cleveland could not restrain the local newspapers from reporting what Clevelanders already knew. Furthermore, the media announced there was a psychopathic maniac on the loose in the city. Elliot Ness met secretly with his new head of the Homicide Division, Sergeant James Hogan, and his newly appointed head of the Crime Lab, David Coles. Ness desired to know the opinions each investigator had regarding the murders. Hogan pointed out the distinctions between the various victims, while Coles believed that a single killer murdered all of the victims thus far. The two investigators waited for their new boss to make his assessment. Ness then turned to Hogan and stated, Jim, you've got a real problem on your hands. The same guy did them all. Too much similarity to be coincidental. Death by decapitation. The expert hand with a knife, bodies all cleaned up and neat. I can't tell why he kills women one way and men another, but it's the same man, I guarantee you. Ness then made it clear to both men that the newspapers were not to be alerted to the fact that the police were looking for a single killer and that no further information was to be furnished the media about the murders during the convention. Ness then said to Hogan that he knew the detective sergeant would do everything in his power to catch the quote, maniac, end quote and Cowles would put his crime lab at the complete disposal of the sergeant in apprehending this fiend. This signified to the investigators that Ness would not get involved in the investigation any more than he had to. Ness's job at this point was to root out corruption in the police force, the task assigned to him by Mayor Burton. The Republican convention proved to be a great success, with the delegates nominating Alfred Landon as their candidate to run against Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Ness's security protocols worked perfectly. Immediately after the convention came the Great Lakes Exposition, where people from all over the world came to Cleveland. The coroner made death masks and exhibited them at the Great Lakes Exposition in the summer of 1936. With thousands of persons filing past the death mask, police could still not identify the tattooed man. On July 22, 1936, Detective Orly May reported that Sergeant Hogan arrived at the Big Creek area where a teenage girl discovered the body of a male victim near a hobo camp. Police believed the victim to be a 40-year-old man. Quote, The dead man was lying on his stomach in the nude, and the head was partly wrapped up in his clothing about 15 feet north of the body. 
It appeared that the body had been lying at this point for at least two months and was very badly decomposed." End quote. His clothing contained quite a bit of mud and the garments piled up next to his head. The coat contained bloodstains. The coroner, Dr. Pierce, exhibited some doubt as to whether this victim had actually been murdered by the same person as the others. Upon his examination, Dr. Pierce noted that the body was in an advanced state of decomposition with the skin missing in certain large areas of the corpse. Because of the decomposition, fingerprinting was impossible. Other than the clothing, no other clues existed as to identify the body. Authorities recovered his head, but this victim still went unidentified. In mid-September 1936, the American Legion Convention was set to commence in Cleveland, which would signify a nice ending to the summer following the Republican Convention and the Great Lakes Expo. But still, a grotesque killer was on the loose. On September 10, 1936, a hobo named Jerry Harris sat near the East 37th Street Pier waiting for an eastbound freight train. When he looked into the water, Harris noticed two halves of a human torso floating in the creek. After police dragged the creek for the remainder of the body, they subsequently found the legs that had been cut below the knees, but were unable to find a head. Police also recovered clothing, but the police never identified this victim. Sergeant Hogan felt that the hysteria grew, and when the local newspaper dubbed the killer as, quote, the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, end quote, Sergeant Hogan believed that the hysteria could no longer be contained. As a result of law enforcement frustration with the apprehension and capture of the killer, Ness decided to assume command of the investigation. This as a result of Sergeant Hogan mentioning to a local newspaper that the killer may live within the Kingsbury Run area. Ness became agitated at the remark and thus took control of the investigation. This interrupted Ness's investigation into police department graft. Ness urged his department to bring in every hobo for questioning and warned them to find somewhere else to live until the killer could be apprehended, and Ness assigned 20 detectives to the case full-time to follow every lead, interview every witness, and investigate, quote, suspicious persons, end quote. The detectives also tried some pretty unorthodox methods to catch the killer, including, but not limited to, dressing as hobos and mingling with the other hobos in Kingsbury Run. Other detectives went into the seedier areas of Cleveland into gay bars and dens of prostitution to discover the identity of the killer. The head of the Federal Narcotics Bureau in Cleveland even made the statement that a marijuana user was responsible for the murders. The Cleveland News offered a reward of $1,000 for any information leading to the apprehension and prosecution of the, quote, Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, end quote. The Cleveland City Council met to consider a like-minded reward. Detectives believed that the killer played games with them, leaving the discarded bodies close to the railroad police office, and even later one would be found near a police precinct office. The absence of evidence denoted to the police that this killer was not only cunning, but exhibited determined skills to take apart human bodies with no remorse and with a psychopathy never before seen by the detectives assigned to the case. The one thing either they or the media could not figure out was motive. What motive drove someone to commit such horrific murders and then taunt everyone with his elusiveness? Ness decided to assemble some experts to determine the type of individual they looked for through their various operations. Dr. Pierce and Dr. Reuben Strauss, a coroner who performed some of the earlier autopsies, met with Ness along with now Lieutenant Coles and Sergeant Hogan, and at the end of the day determined a rudimentary profile of the killer. One man working alone murdered the six known victims. The Lady of the Lake was not included in the official count because the murder occurred in 1934, a full year before the Andrasi murder. The killer was not obviously insane, but there were disagreements as to whether the killer was a homosexual. The other mutilations to the body, sans the testicles, may have been an effort to keep the bodies from being identified or transporting the bodies. The killer had a working knowledge of anatomy, not necessarily a physician or surgeon, but someone who would know the anatomical landmarks, such as a butcher. The killer was large and strong, considering the bodies had to be carried great distances. The killer was, most likely, a resident of Kingsbury Run. 
The killer had a private place to murder and dismember his victims as the decapitation, especially when in some of the murders this was the main cause of death, would produce venal and arterial spray. The killer chose his victims from the lowest classes of society, therefore people not likely to be missed, or the killer expressed the need to eliminate quote undesirables end quote from society. The panel also believed that the killer improved his means of remaining undetected as the murders went on, removing heads and hands, leaving the bodies to be found without these anatomical pieces that could produce identification. And, with the examination of the placement of the victims within Kingsbury Run, the killer increased risks to intimidate the police and getting caught by continually using the area as his graveyard. After the sixth victim, Elliot Ness allocated plentiful resources to the case. One of the detectives working the case, Peter Merillo, stood out. Merillo spoke several European languages and began his career as a motorcycle cop. Although highly intelligent, Merillo was also eccentric. Merillo expressed an extreme acumen in catching homosexual men in compromising positions. Homosexuality was illegal in Cleveland at the time, and Merillo made it his mission to arrest, quote, perverts, end quote, and put them in jail. Merillo used questionable methods with which to arrest homosexuals, mainly by following two men leaving a gay bar to a hotel or a residence, waiting a short time, and then busting in to catch them in a compromising position. Judges were very hesitant to try cases of this nature because of the methods Merillo used. Peter Merillo wanted desperately to be assigned to the Kingsbury Run case and eventually received his wish. On February 23, 1937, the body of an unidentified female was found at Euclid Beach on the Lake Erie shore, approximately near the same spot where the 1934 victim Lady of the Lake had been found. The coroner, newly elected Samuel Gerber, estimated that the body had been there some three or four days and was missing her head, her arms, and the torso had been bisected. Gerber had unique qualifications for this position. He possessed not only a medical degree, but a law degree as well. He spent countless hours on the research for the case, and Cleveland's fathers expected a great deal from his expertise. Indeed, Dr. Gerber did not disappoint. His assessment of one of the most recent victims stated, the victim's legs were removed with two clean sweeping strokes of a heavy knife and the arms were removed with the murderer's usual skill. The bisection of the torso showed multiple hesitation marks. Unlike most of the other victims, death did not appear to be caused by decapitation. The blood clots in the heart indicated that the decapitation was post-mortem. The arms, legs, and clothing were never found. Dr. Gerber also added that he believed the perpetrator of these horrendous crimes to be right-handed, using a very heavy, sharp knife, and he had a working knowledge of human anatomy. The new coroner was unable to properly evaluate the sexual undertones associated with the crimes, but the quote, mad butcher, end quote, appeared to be the first sexual psychopath on record at the time to murder members of both sexes. Because of his involvement with the case and the new information gleaned from Dr. Gerber, Ness contacted his sources in the local newspapers and asked them to, quote, tone down, end quote, the sensationalism associated with the murders in Kingsbury Run. The added publicity for the crimes fed into the killer's ego and therefore he would be harder to catch. Furthermore, the more publicity the case got, the more useless leads police would have to chase. Dr. Gerber disagreed with Ness as the coroner had quite the ego himself. Nevertheless, the editors of the local newspapers agreed and held restraint when it came to the publicity surrounding the case. Police dubbed the latest unidentified corpse as, quote, Jane Doe 1, end quote. On June 6, 1937, a teenager named Russell Lawyer found the skeletal remains of a black female within a rotting burlap bag beneath the Lorraine Carnegie Bridge, missing her head and a rib. Police later recovered the head, and the coroner estimated the body had been there for a little over a year before its discovery. Police dubbed this discovery, quote, Jane Doe 2, end quote. Police received a letter claiming the victim to be a prostitute named Rose Wallace, Wallace's dental records matched the corpse and an identification by her son strongly indicated that this body was that of Rose Wallace. 
The only doubt that may have hinged upon the identification was the assertion that the coroner stated that this body had been dead for a year. Relatives reported Wallace missing only 10 months before. Dr. Gerber and Sergeant Hogan dismissed this identification, but Detective Merillo firmly believed the corpse found by lawyer to be that of Rose Wallace. On July 6, 1937, the body of a decapitated male was found floating in the Cuyahoga River in the Cleveland Flats. The head was never recovered, and the coroner estimated that the body had been floating there, in addition to the corpse's two thighs. Dr. Gerber estimated the body to have been in the water no less than approximately two or three days. For a short time after the initial discovery, pieces of this corpse floated downriver, except for the head. With this discovery, the coroner noticed that the internal organs had been removed, but searchers never retrieved them. Police dubbed this victim John Doe 5. Upon more intense examination of the previous victims in comparison to the most recent ones, authorities concentrated on doctors, medical students, nurses, and even butchers. Police soon focused on one doctor in particular, Dr. Frank E. Sweeney. Authorities learned that Dr. Sweeney grew up near the Kingsbury Run area. He had a problem with alcohol that caused him to lose a wife and some visitation with his children, and he lost his license to practice surgery at a nearby hospital. Sweeney also matched the physical profile of what the killer may look like. He was tall, large, and strong. Although this was not well publicized, police believed Sweeney to be bisexual and possessed a very violent temper when he drank alcohol. Later, in 1937, police abandoned Sweeney as a suspect due to his frequent trips out of town, but his name resurfaced throughout the history of the case with any mention of the Butcher of Kingsbury Run. Lieutenant Cowles ran across a person of interest that renewed his interest in Dr. Sweeney as a suspect. Lieutenant Cowles learned that the Veterans Hospital, where Dr. Sweeney worked, shared their services with a prison honor farm. On that honor farm, and at the Veterans Hospital for that matter, a convicted burglar named Alex Archaki was serving out the rest of his sentence in the prison honor farm and began a symbiotic relationship with Dr. Sweeney. Dr. Sweeney, it was reported, often made trips to the prison farm where Archaki would provide Sweeney with alcohol. In exchange, Dr. Sweeney would write prescriptions for barbiturates. Although interesting that Dr. Sweeney openly broke the law through his vocation, Archaki gave Lt. Cowles something far more interesting. Archaki stated he first became acquainted with Dr. Sweeney after meeting the physician in a local bar in Cleveland. Dr. Sweeney bought the young man a few drinks and then began asking him some personal questions. Where was Archaki from? Did he have any family in the city? Was Archaki married? Archaki thought nothing of it at the time, but later he believed Dr. Sweeney was interviewing him to become a victim. Archaki also informed Lt. Cowles that Dr. Sweeney appeared absent several times from the hospital. These absences coincided with the, quote, estimated times of death for several victims, end quote. Archaki averred his positivity with Lt. Cowles about the dates that Dr. Sweeney never appeared at the hospital. Lt. Cowles researched Dr. Sweeney's background more thoroughly after acquiring the information from Archaki. The detective learned that Sweeney was born in East Cleveland, just on the outskirts of Kingsbury Run, in 1894. Francis Edward Sweeney grew up in a poor family, losing his mother at nine years of age. His father received some bad injuries and could not find work. Despite the circumstances he and his siblings faced, Sweeney made a determined effort to make a success of himself. He worked several full-time jobs while attending college. After college, he attended pharmacy school and then medical school, where he proved to be such a popular student that his classmates elected him vice president of their class. After graduating medical school, Sweeney became a surgical resident at St. Alexis Hospital. His siblings remembered that he was very engrossed with his studies and the knowledge he acquired from treating people at the hospital. But he was never too busy when one of his siblings got sick. He left the hospital to attend to them immediately. The pressures of the job began to take its toll and Sweeney took to drink in order to cope. He was admitted to the hospital for alcoholism on a number of occasions. Since graduating from medical school, Sweeney married in 1927. 
and when he succumbed to drink, he became violent toward co-workers and abusive towards his wife, forcing his marriage to collapse and his career to disappear before his eyes. He stayed in a period of perpetual drunkenness until finally, in 1934, he and his wife of seven years separated. Cowles learned that Sweeney suffered several injuries during World War I, including a head injury in which he received a pension. But several of his other psychoses ran in the bloodline, including mental illness. With this new profile, Lieutenant Cowles thought certain that Dr. Sweeney functioned in an alter ego as the, quote, mad butcher of Kingsbury Run, end quote. In March of 1938, a dog found a man's severed leg in Sandusky, Ohio, approximately 65 miles from Cleveland. Lieutenant Cowles traveled to the area in all haste to see whether a connection existed between this body part and the torso killer in Cleveland. Subsequently, it turned out that this body part had been removed through a medical procedure and may have been misplaced, but no connection existed to the torso killer. On April 8, 1939, a human leg had been found in the Cuyahoga River near Cleveland Flats. A conflict developed between Ness and coroner Dr. Gerber when Ness accused the coroner of desiring a larger national reputation with Dr. Gerber hungering for publicity in the decapitation cases. It got to the point where whenever the newspapers would print something about the murders, the public accepted Dr. Gerber's word as authority on these types of killings. When Ness insisted that an independent evaluation take place, Dr. Gerber became infuriated and professed, quote, I answer to the taxpayers, not to the Cleveland Police Department, end quote. On May 8th, a woman's thigh was found near the same location in the river, east of the West 4th Street Bridge. Police conducted a search later under the bridge and discovered a burlap sack containing the victim's headless torso cut in half, another thigh, and another foot. The head and arms were never found. On August 16, 1938, Another decapitated female corpse was found near the East 9th Street Lakeshore dump. The coroner determined that the body had been dead for the last four to six months. Police later recovered the head. This became Jane Doe number four. After the discovery of the female and male victims, Lieutenant Cowles understood the political atmosphere surrounding his prime suspect, Dr. Sweeney. Sweeney was the first cousin of U.S. Senator Martin L. Sweeney. Senator Sweeney, if he realized one of his relatives was suspected of these most horrific murders, the senator would believe a political agenda against him due to the fact that he incessantly criticized Mayor Burton's administration. Lieutenant Cowles decided to engage surveillance on Dr. Sweeney, but had to find someone he trusted to report only the facts and not make any suppositions. Lieutenant Cowles assigned a rookie named Thomas Whalen to follow Dr. Sweeney and record his findings. The elder police veteran believed that the rampant corruption that plagued the Cleveland Police Department for so long had not reached the young, ambitious rookie. When Whalen began his surveillance, he followed Dr. Sweeney into a department store where he observed the physician looking at merchandise. After a few minutes, Dr. Sweeney turned and left the store, walking into the street followed closely by Whalen. When the doctor made a sharp left turn, Whalen followed. When Whalen made the turn, Dr. Sweeney stood there waiting for him. Whalen felt embarrassed but turned around and walked away. Dr. Sweeney smiled and then introduced himself to the young rookie and stated, quote, if we're going to be together so often, we might as well be acquainted, end quote. Now that Sweeney knew he was being followed, it really didn't matter. Dr. Sweeney continued to toy with the young man and other officers that continued to follow him. Lieutenant Coles took advantage of Sweeney being out on the streets and searched his office and his rooms for any evidence. The police even searched through his mail. Victims number 11 and 12, the man and woman discovered on August 16, 1938, signified a change in the killer's dumping ground. He never used the most recent one before and authorities hoped that the mad butcher would, somehow, make a mistake and be caught. But Ness and Cowles doubted that the two most recent victims were actually murdered. It was then that the public and the politicians began to criticize Ness for his inability to catch the killer. In an effort to become more proactive, Ness led a raid on the so-called, quote, shantytowns, end quote, in Kingsbury Run. 
disoriented hobos were chased down by the police, arrested, taken to the police station, and fingerprinted. Police also searched for the mad butcher, but found only worldly possessions of the unfortunates. In a desperate attempt to deny the killer of a hideout, Ness ordered the shanty town be burned to the ground. Newspapers criticized Ness for his aggressive tactics, but the burning of the hobo home showed the desperation of the investigation. Ness, feeling the pressure, decided to notify Lieutenant Cowles to bring in their only suspect, Dr. Sweeney, for a secret interrogation. Lieutenant Cowles gave Dr. Sweeney a choice. Either come in for the secret interrogation, or he would bring the physician down to the station, notifying the press of his arrest, and bring further embarrassment to his family. Dr. Sweeney chose the lesser of two evils. After sobering for three days, Elliot Ness, Lieutenant Cowles, court psychiatrist Dr. Royal Grossman, and the inventor of the polygraph machine, Dr. Leonard Keeler, appeared at the hotel. For the next two hours, on August 23, 1938, Lieutenant Cowles and Dr. Grossman conducted the interrogation of Dr. Sweeney. Sweeney played with the interrogators, and Ness knew it. Then, Ness escorted the confident doctor into the adjoining bedroom where Dr. Keeler had prepared his polygraph machine to test Dr. Sweeney. After several innocuous questions about whether he was Dr. Frank Sweeney and whether he knew Edward Andrazi, Dr. Keeler asked more specific questions. After approximately an hour, Keeler asked Dr. Sweeney to stay in the room with the machine while he met with Lieutenant Cowles and Dr. Grossman. Dr. Keeler confidently stated to the two men, quote, looks like he's your guy, end quote. Ness agreed with Dr. Keeler's assessment and then turned to Dr. Grossman and asked, quote, what do you think, end quote. Grossman answered, quote, I believe we have a classic psychopath here with the likelihood of some schizophrenia. His father spent the last three years of his life locked up, a violent schizoid personality aggravated by chronic alcoholism, end quote. Ness then went into the bedroom where Dr. Keeler interrogated Dr. Sweeney. Sweeney turned to Ness and asked, quote, Well, are you satisfied now? End quote. Ness replied, quote, Yes, I think you're the killer. End quote. Dr. Sweeney then approached Ness very slowly, leaned into his face and stated very intimidatingly, quote, Then prove it. End quote. Ness admitted years later that he never felt more terrified than when he was left alone in the suite with this, quote, madman, end quote. Lieutenant Cowles, Dr. Keeler, and Dr. Grossman left the suite to get some coffee. Ness soon tracked down the trio and ordered Lieutenant Cowles back to the suite immediately. Dr. Keeler subsequently tested Dr. Sweeney several more times that day with the same result. But Ness knew that the case could be highly politically charged with Sweeney's relations, should they get involved, and only circumstantial evidence existed that pointed toward Dr. Sweeney as the mad butcher of Kingsbury Run. After the secret interrogation, Dr. Sweeney checked himself into various hospitals to receive treatment for his alcohol addiction. The physician stayed in hospitals from 1938. Although Dr. Sweeney was confined to these various institutions, he still roamed the neighborhoods surrounding their grounds and wrote prescriptions for he and his friends until authorities notified local pharmacies cutting off his supply. Dr. Sweeney died in 1965. On the night of July 14, 1966, at a residence located on Chicago's South Side, nursing student Judy Dykton decided she wanted to study for an exam in the wee hours of the morning. 
Dighton thought she should better do some laundry before getting her studying done. When she arose from her bed, Dighton turned off the fan she had been running for days due to the extremely hot Chicago weather that summer. When she turned off the fan, Dighton swore she could hear the sounds of what she termed to be like a small animal crying outside in front of the townhouse. At that time, Dighton merely ignored the whimpering and went about doing her laundry. After turning on the washing machine, she went back upstairs to continue her studying. Sitting at a small desk, Dighton heard the crying once more, but at that time she said it sounded like a small child crying. When Dighton pulled the shades of her room open, she saw a woman across the street at 2319 East 100th Street suspended on a ledge. The woman, a very small and what appeared to be Asian lady, kept repeating, quote, Oh my God, they're all dead, end quote. When Dykton witnessed this, she grabbed something with which to cover herself and ran across the street to investigate. When Dykton reached the residence across the street, she approached the young woman who had been crying, Corazon Amaral, who had been crouched upon a window ledge. Amaral shook uncontrollably and cried incessantly. Dykton entered the residence and walked to the living room. She first discovered a nursing student, Gloria Davy, nude and lying on the couch with her hands tied behind her back, with a strip of cloth in her mouth so tightly jammed that, quote, a roll of skin puffed over the cloth around her neck, end quote. Davy was dead, and her skin took on a bluish tint. Dykton immediately ran to the residence of the house mother, a Mrs. Bissoni, and yelled, quote, there's trouble in 19, end quote. Mrs. Bissoni awoke some of the other students and together they made their way down to 2319. When the house mother and the other nursing students made it to the residence, Amaral managed to jump from the 10-foot ledge to the ground and stood on the front stairs, quote, frozen between the horror in the house and the outside world, end quote. Amaral then screamed, quote, everyone on the sandpan has been killed, end quote. She stated this over and over again. When Bassone and another nursing student, Leona Bonzac, entered the living room, Bonzac touched Gloria Davy on the leg and said, quote, Davy, end quote, hoping that the nursing student was only unconscious and not dead. But Davy didn't move. She had already expired. Bonzac left the living room and slowly walked up the stairs to the second floor. When she peered into the bathroom near the landing of the stairs, she found another body. She called out, quote, Matuzek, end quote. She received no answer. Then Bonzac crept into the other bedrooms upstairs. In both of the bedrooms, Bonzac found the rest of the nursing students who stayed there. The room was covered with blood, and the nursing students appeared brutalized. When she approached one of the other students, Nina Schmael, she removed the pillow that covered her face. Schmael laid on her back with her hands tied, her legs spread apart for all exposure, an apparent knife wound to her chest, and a cloth wrapped very tightly around her neck. Bonzac walked back down the stairs very slowly and met Rizzoni. Bonzac informed Rizzoni not to climb the stairs. They were all dead and nothing could be done. Rizzoni walked over to the telephone and called the South Chicago Hospital and stated that all of her, quote, girls, end quote, had been murdered. When the hospital asked her which ones needed help, she said she couldn't talk and just very reservedly stated, quote, I need help, end quote. Outside of the residence, several of the nursing students who accompanied Rizzoni to the crime scene flagged down Officer Daniel Kelly, a mere rookie on the force with 18 months under his belt. Officer Kelly immediately radioed to his precinct and told them that he needed some backup. When Officer Kelly entered the residence, he realized that he knew one of the deceased nurses, Gloria Davy. In the past, Officer Kelly dated Davy's sister. Obviously distraught, he brandished his service revolver and headed up the stairs. When he exited the residence again, he radioed back to the precinct, Help! 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 Oh my God, I dated her sister. Oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. Oh, give me the sergeant. Give me the lieutenant. My God. This outpouring of shock was heard by a radio police reporter, Joe Cummings, as he drove around the city's south side to find something newsworthy. Cummings then said to himself that this was big. During his journey to the crime scene, 
Cummins heard Officer Kelly, who kept saying, Oh my God, they're all dead, over and over again. After listening to the pleading from Officer Kelly's sergeant as to where the officer called from, Officer Kelly finally gave the address, 2319 East 100th Street. When Cummings finally arrived at the scene, he grabbed his tape recorder and walked off toward Officer Kelly. Bonzac, Dykton, and Rizzoni tried to calm Amarillo down inside a nearby residence located at 2315 East 100th Street. Cummings noticed that Officer Kelly appeared to be walking in circles with his duty hat on backwards and his shirt slightly untucked in the front. Cummings approached the officer and stated that he was a reporter and he was entering the scene and promised that he would not touch anything while in there. Quote, it's a homicide, end quote, Kelly told Cummings before he walked into 2319. Cummings went in and noticed the dead body of Davy on the couch. Cummings then walked back outside to ask Officer Kelly about just one body. Just then, Officer Kelly then said, quote, go upstairs, end quote. Cummings went up to the second floor, looked down the hallway, and turned right. The sun just started to peek over the horizon as morning began, but the whole floor appeared dark. Cummings walked down the hallway and noticed to his right dead bodies of the nursing students. In another room that Cummings investigated, he found three more dead bodies, brutally abused. Oh my God, he whispered to himself. Cummings then turned to walk back down the stairs and past the bathroom where he discovered another body. The reporter noticed a handprint on the bathroom door. Cummings observed fingerprints and that a screen was missing from a window. He said to himself, quote, What the hell's this? Eight dead women, end quote. As he walked down the stairs, the reporter's stomach began to churn and he felt nauseous. Cummings looked into the living room one more time where Davy's body lay, and when he reached the front entrance, he could hold his sickness no more and vomited in the front yard. As soon as he emptied himself, Cummings again walked up to Officer Kelly and noticed a high-pitched alarm-like noise. Officer Kelly informed the reporter that that was the sole survivor. Seeing a chance at getting ahead of the other reporters, Cummings walked over to 2315 and saw a crack in the door. When he looked in, he observed a doctor injecting Amaral in an attempt to calm the young woman down. Cummings got on his radio and spoke to someone at his radio station that there had just been a mass murder on the south side of Chicago. After calling in some of the details, Cummings went into the crime scene and to the second floor again. He didn't know why, but he did. As he took some further steps into the second floor hallway, Cummins heard a squish with every step. When he looked down at his shoes, he noticed the blood had leaked into the hallway where he walked. Cummings rushed down the stairs and vomited once more. The reporter stated later that in all the years of his reporting, he never saw a crime scene so brutal. A few minutes later, Homicide Commander Frank Flanagan pulled Cummings off to the side and stated to him that he should mention that the victim's throats had been cut. Commander Flanagan stated that every lunatic in the city would confess or take credit for these killings and, quote, leave the particulars out. Only the killer will know what happened to those girls, end quote. Detective Jack Walenda arrived on the scene. Described as a big burly man, even he displayed dismay and horror at the crime scene. When Detective Walenda first examined the body of Gloria Davy, he noticed that her hands had been tied with, quote, double knots, end quote. Knots that looked like a professional tied them, made from bed sheets. The investigator also noticed that he saw what he thought to be semen between her buttocks. Buttons from Davy's blouse were found all over the stairs. Detective Walenda theorized that the killer must have torn the buttons from Davy's shirt on the way to bring her down the stairs. The investigator also found a man's t-shirt, size 38 to 40, tossed on the floor. Detective Walenda next went up the stairs to one of the bedrooms and discovered the body of Pamela Wilkening. She was gagged and stabbed near her heart. Lying near her was the body of Suzanne Farris, lying face down in a pool of blood with a white nurse's stocking around her neck. Farris had 18 stab wounds to her chest and neck. Suzanne's close friend, Mary Ann Jordan, lay on her back with three large stab wounds in her chest, one in her neck and one in the eye. In the northwest corner of the apartment, 
Nina Schmael had her night clothes pulled above her breasts with strips of cloth tied around her neck with the familiar knots that Detective Willenda noted on Gloria Davy. Schmael suffered from superficial knife wounds, quote, in a ritualistic pattern around her neck, end quote. But it appeared that the killer broke her neck. Under a blue cover, Detective Walenda found Valentina Pison, her face downward, appeared to have suffered from a deep cut across her throat that bisected her voice box. Across Pison's body lay another nursing student, Merlita Garguglio, face up, having been strangled and stabbed. When Detective Walenda entered the door through the hallway and to his right, he found the body of Patricia Matusek in the bathroom, lying on her back with her nightgown rolled up to her chest and her panties down. She had been strangled to death. The investigator also noted that it appeared the murderer kicked Matusek in the stomach as she sustained a very large bruise in the abdomen area. Bloody towels covered the floor of the bathroom where Matusek lay. Detective Walenda later remarked that this was the worst crime scene he ever investigated in his long career. The director of nursing was called and she could only identify three of the victims. Once the coroner called for transport of the bodies to the morgue, patrol wagons showed up for the journey as the coroner only had one hearse. Law enforcement sealed the house and brought in the crime lab technicians to see if there were any clues as to the identity of the murderer. At this point, police knew they had to find the killer and fast. Immediately, search teams were organized and they canvassed the neighborhoods surrounding the crime scene with a description given to them by Emma Rao. She described the man she saw as six feet tall, blonde hair, approximately 160 pounds, and he had a southern drawl when he spoke. Detective Edward Willisinki questioned some people at a local gas station that functioned as a hangout for some pretty questionable characters. Detective Willisinki discovered that the owner of the gas station heard of a young man who may match that description who left his bags at the gas station two days before and was visibly agitated that he missed a ship and lost out on a job. The detective then investigated the clue with another quote sweep end quote team in questioning people at the Merchant Marine Union Hall on 100th Street. The investigators learned that the agent who gave the assignments through the Union Hall had never heard nor did he know anyone who matched the description of the killer. Investigators then went back to the gas station and convinced the manager to call the owner of the station, Dick Polo. Awakened from a deep sleep, Polo acknowledged that a young man matching the killer's description came to the station and mentioned that he missed a ship and a job on that ship. The man Polo referenced had a deep southern drawl. Polo recommended a boarding house to the disappointed man. Flop houses and bars were thoroughly canvassed then the investigators decided to go back to the Merchant Marine Union Hall to speak with the booking agent once again. Putting pressure on the nervous man, he paused any conversation he carried with the investigators, went to his trash basket, and pulled out an assignment sheet. On that piece of paper, the agent read aloud the name of Richard B. Speck. The agent remembered the man because of his heavy southern drawl that, at the time, the agent barely understood what he was saying. Detective Willisinki found Speck's file at the Union Hall and he matched the description perfectly, but he had no criminal record locally. The search for Speck began in earnest and it seemed that the police kept missing him from wherever he went. On the morning of July 14th, the day of the murders, Speck walked into a dive bar known as Pete's Tap at approximately 10.30 a.m., well rested, showered and looking neat. Bar patrons noticed that Speck carried a large knife attached to his belt that he gave to the bartender to hold. A month before, Speck pawned a jeweled watch which the bartender, Ray Crawford, purchased soon thereafter. Speck had some money in his pocket and bought the watch back from Crawford. During Speck's visit to the bar, he managed to sneak behind it, grab the knife, and then put the bartender in a chokehold, placing the knife to the man's throat. It was then that Speck stated that is how he would kill someone. Then he released Crawford, who didn't think the action proved funny at all. When Speck sat back at the bar, he weaved tremendous falsities about how he killed people in Vietnam. William Kirkland, another barfly, purchased the knife from Speck, who claimed it had belonged to a veteran. 
but in actuality, Speck's brother-in-law, Gene Thornton, gave him the knife. Speck now had a drinking partner for the night, and he and Kirkland went across the street to another dive known as the Soko Grad. The two men continued their drinking at the bar, and Speck learned that he left a survivor at the scene. He turned to Kirkland when he learned the news and stated, It must have been some dirty that done it. Speck told another tale of how he hit his brother-in-law over the head with a bottle, causing his sister to throw him out of the house. The wanted man then claimed that his sister gave him $85, and so he left the residence. The rest of the night included Speck and an old drinking buddy, Robert R. Red Gerald, another southern boy. The two drank until Gerald became too ill and finally decided he needed to get some sleep. Speck brought Gerald to the room that the former rented at the shipyard inn. Speck left his buddy there while he continued his binge. While Speck went to the bar located downstairs at the boarding house, Detective Willisinki suggested strongly to the booking agent at the Union Hall to call Speck at his last known telephone number and tell him that he had a job for him. As luck would have it, when the agent telephoned the shipyard in, Speck answered the call. The agent informed Speck that he needed to report to the Union Hall immediately to gather his assignment on a ship called the Sinclair Great Lakes. Speck felt something suspicious as he knew that the Sinclair had sailed from Chicago a few days before, and he told the agent that he was up north and it would take him some time to get to the Union Hall. Speck never materialized. The suspected murderer awoke his friend and brought his bags downstairs, calling for a cab. Gerald sat on the curb, holding his head as he still felt the effects of the drinking marathon. Leaving his comrade on the curb, the accused killer played pool by himself inside the shipyard inn until the cab arrived. Just then, three detectives walked into the bar and began asking questions of the patrons while Speck listened, never indicating that he was the man they were looking for. When the cabbie arrived at the bar, he walked in and shouted, quote, commercial, end quote. Speck swigged down his drink and left the premises by the side door. Gerald and Speck entered the cab, and Speck instructed the cabbie to head north toward his sister's house. The cabbie became suspicious when Speck could not give the address of his sister's house, claiming it was in some seedy part of Chicago. The cabbie drove to a place known as Cabrini Green, a slum. One of the residents of the area that witnessed Speck exiting the taxi stated that she could not understand a white man with suitcases wanting to come to this area of town. Speck then walked to the Raleigh Inn, another flea bag hotel, and coerced his way into letting the manager, Ota Hollinger, to rent him a room under the alias of, quote, John Staten, end quote. Once a hotel of grandeur, the Raleigh in the 1960s had devolved into a single-room flophouse, the perfect place for a ne'er-do-well such as Speck to get lost. One of the clerks working there remembered a man matching Speck's description coming to the hotel with a black prostitute. The clerk also remembered that the prostitute called the man she was with, quote, Richard, end quote. Later, with the transaction completed, the young black girl came down and informed the clerk that John Staten had a gun. On the following morning, the clerk, Algie Lemhart, called the police and asked them to come and sort it out. Two police officers arrived at approximately 8.30 that morning, and when Speck awoke, groggy of course from the drinking he'd done the night before, two police officers stood over the hungover Speck and questioned him for a little over 15 minutes. In hindsight, it appeared that not all police precincts were aware that a mass murderer was at large, in addition to not knowing the physical description of the suspect. The officers checked his identification and passport. With the recent brush with the detectives at the shipyard inn and the two police officers at the Raleigh, Speck considered himself very lucky up to this point. The officers confiscated the weapon and never reported it to their watch commander. As they left the hotel, they informed the clerk that Speck was, quote, harmless, end quote. Later that evening, Speck hit the dive bars in the area, finally arriving at the Pink Twist Inn, where he drank more and lulled himself into another, of many, drunken stupors. Even though the trails of communication were slow, the Chicago Police Department wanted to make sure whom they were dealing with. They asked for assistance from the Federal Bureau of Investigation with the fingerprints acquired at the crime scene. Investigators then tracked the suspect from the shipyard inn through the commercial cab company 
and when they interviewed the cab driver, they learned that Speck was dropped off in Cabrini Green. Sergeant Mike Clancy, one of the members of the task force hunting Speck, reached Speck's sister and retraced his steps from the time he left Dallas some time ago. Then the police picked up Red Gerald, who gave the investigators a very specific itinerary of Speck's movements. At this point, police issued a stop order for the Union Hall if Speck were to show up there. In his further attempt to evade the dragnet that closed in around him, Speck walked out of the Raleigh Inn stating that he was going to do his laundry. The manager and the clerk never saw Speck again. The suspect then met with two winos who convinced him to stay at the Star Hotel, another flop house. One of the winos, a guy named One Eye, told Speck that he would show him how to jump freight trains and travel the country. But One Eye grew tired of Speck and tried to ditch him. Speck at this time seemed desperate to get away from the city. One Eye stated that he wanted to stay in the city to make some more money as a day laborer. Speck then abandoned the idea to hop freights and then went to sell some of his possessions. On the morning of July 17, 1966, Commander Flanagan learned that the fingerprint they retrieved from the crime scene matched Speck's fingerprints. When police officers learned this fact, some of them cried, but others took on more of a sense of urgency to locate this killer. With this evidence in hand, the State Attorney General's office issued a warrant for Richard Speck's arrest. The young assistant attorney in the state office typed up the arrest warrant, but he wanted the press handled efficiently so that Speck would not slip through the dragnet. But this concern arose too late as the police chief already called a press conference to identify the killer. After Speck sold some more of his belongings on Skit Row, he went to the local liquor store and purchased a small bottle of wine and a few newspapers. By this time, he knew the police were on to him as he saw his face splattered across the papers. Speck rushed back to his rented room at the Star Hotel, drank the wine, and in a drunken rage, broke the wine bottle and attempted to slash his wrists and his inner elbow with the broken glass. Speck then dragged himself to One Eye's cubicle, then switched cubicles to be in his own. With the newspaper strewn on the floor near the bed and his profuse bleeding onto that floor, he felt soon he would not have to face the consequences of his actions. When One Eye returned to the hotel, he began walking around to see what friends remained. When he reached Speck's cubicle, he saw the blood and immediately called the police to report the man that they were looking for was located at the Star Hotel. When the ambulance and the police arrived, they rushed Speck to Cook County Hospital, the same hospital that housed the bodies of the nurses he murdered. And when doctors and nurses prepared him for surgery to close the wounds he made, when the doctor, a first-year resident by the name of Dr. Leroy Smith, noticed that the patient had a tattoo. Using his own spit to clear away the blood so he could see it more clearly, he noticed the ink on the patient's arm that read, quote, born to raise hell, end quote. Speck consistently pleaded to the doctor to give him water. The doctor hurriedly asked the attending nurse to grab the newspaper from the other room that contained Speck's photograph. When Speck pled for more water, Dr. Smith grabbed the back of Speck's neck and stated quite angrily, Did you give water to the nurses? Dr. Smith then released his grip from behind Speck's head and summoned a police officer down the hall to inform him that the man he will soon be operating on to save his life is the same man police searched for within the last three days. The policeman then called his commanding officer and let them know that Richard Speck was lying on a gurney awaiting surgery to repair the arteries he cut through. Once authorities learned that Richard Speck was a medical captive at the hospital, they pushed their way through the halls to make sure he did not escape justice. Richard Speck was born in Monmouth, Illinois on December 6, 1941, the seventh of eight children to Benjamin Franklin Speck and Mary Margaret Carbaugh Speck. Speck and his younger sister, Carolyn, were much younger than their other siblings. Speck's father made a living to support his huge family as a packer for the Western Stoneware Company and had previously worked as a farmer and logger. Benjamin Speck died of a heart attack when Richard was six years old. Speck's mother then remarried to a man who was the exact opposite of his father. Speck's stepfather, Carl August Randolph Lindbergh, 
spent most of his adult life in correctional institutions and maintained a high level of alcoholism. He often beat young Speck and abused him verbally as well. Speck did poorly in school and needed glasses, but refused to wear them. Because of his disinterest in school, Speck dropped out at the age of 16. This is when his worst problem came to the surface and got worse. Speck started drinking alcohol at the age of 12 and at 15 years old, he became drunk almost every day. From the age of 16, Speck committed various offenses, often being sentenced to short stretches and then released. Also at this age, Speck married a young girl, but their relationship was filled with violence and alcohol-fueled arguments. Speck continued to work odd little jobs in Texas until July of 1963, when Speck tried to cash a fellow employee's paycheck in addition to stealing some cigarettes, beer, and $3 in cash. The court sentenced him to three years, but the state of Texas released him after 16 months for serving time in Huntsville Prison. Less than a week after his parole, Speck brandished a knife and threatened a woman in the parking lot of her apartment complex. Again, the court for this case gave him 16 months in prison, but due to a typographical error, Speck saw freedom after six months. Speck continued his career committing petty crimes until one day in 1966, his sister Carolyn drove him to the Greyhound station and put him on a bus headed for Chicago. Speck stayed a few days with his sister, Martha Thornton, and then went to the place of his birth, Monmouth, Illinois. There he stayed with his brother's family and got a job as a carpenter's helper. Again, a job he held for a short period of time. When Speck learned that the woman he married at 16 remarried two days after their divorce, he moved from his brother's house and into one of the local hotels. Speck drank heavily and very rarely remained sober. On April 3, 1966, Mrs. Virgil Harris, 65, returned to her home after babysitting at 1 a.m. when she confronted a burglar, a man about six feet tall, and spoke with a thick southern drawl. He tied her up, raped her, and then stole the money she earned from babysitting that evening, $2.50. On or about April 10th, a bartender named Mary Kay Pierce left the tavern at 12.25 a.m. on April 9th. Her brother-in-law, Frank, reported her missing on April 13th. Police found Pierce's body in an empty log house behind the tavern, having died from, quote, a blow to her abdomen that ruptured her liver, end quote. After Speck's arrest as the suspect of the murder of the eight nurses, authorities wondered whether he may have been responsible for the rape of Mrs. Harris and then the death of Miss Pierce. Police questioned Speck considerably regarding both Harris's assault and Pierce's murder. When the police searched his room, they discovered some costume jewelry that Mrs. Harris reported missing. Investigators also knew that Speck frequented the bar where Pierce worked. In April 1966, Speck returned to his sister's apartment on the northwest side of Chicago where she lived with her husband, Gene Thornton, and their two teenage daughters. Thornton knew that Speck could not hold down a job and, being a veteran of the U.S. Navy, strongly suggested to Speck that he join the Merchant Marine Service. After providing fingerprints, being photographed and cleared from a physician, Speck found work immediately, but suffered an appendicitis and had to be brought back to shore in order to recuperate. After recovering from the surgery, Speck joined the crew of the ship where he got drunk and had an altercation with one of the officers on board. His brother-in-law then suggested that Speck apply to the local Merchant Marine Hall for a seaman's card so he would find other jobs on other ships. From May to July 1966, Speck found difficulty in holding down a job. On July 8th, Thornton took his brother-in-law to the Seaman's Hall to pick up his card and register for a berth on a ship. Speck discovered that he lost out to a seaman with more seniority on a ship headed for South Vietnam. On the 11th, Speck again took a ride from Thornton to the hall to await a berth. This time, he overstayed his welcome at his sister's and looked for lodging elsewhere. The same thing happened on the following day. He registered for a berth only to see it go to someone else. On this date, Speck dropped off his bags at the Manor Shell filling station and then slept the night in an unfinished house. 
On July 13th, after Speck picked up his bags and registered at the Siemens Hall, he then sat in his brother-in-law's car with his sister and they spoke for the next 30 minutes. Incidentally, Thornton parked the car across the street from where the student nurses lived. Later that afternoon and early evening, with the remainder of the $25 his sister Martha lent to him earlier in the day, Speck visited various taverns in the area and met a woman named Ella May Cooper, whom Speck raped later that evening and stole her 22 caliber Rome revolver, a cheap Saturday night special. After eating at Kay's pilot house, Speck returned to the shipyard inn and drank until approximately 10.20, dressed all in black and armed with a pocket knife, a hunting knife, and the 22 caliber revolver. From there, he walked a mile and a half west to the nurse's townhouse at 2319 East 100th Street. At approximately 11 p.m., Speck broke into the nurse's townhouse which served as a dormitory for nursing students, predominantly some exchange students from the Philippines. Once Speck entered the residence, and for hours Speck methodically rounded up the nursing students and brought them into one room, raping them and then stabbing them to death. Investigators who put together the series of events for that evening believe that Gloria Davy was his last victim. Corazon Amaral managed to escape the carnage by shimmying under a bed while Speck was outside of the main room with another one of the victims. Amaral stayed hidden until approximately 6 a.m. when she ran to an upstairs window and made her way onto the ledge where she started screaming, They're all dead! All my friends are dead! While still at the hospital, Speck made a confession to Dr. Leroy Smith. But because he was heavily sedated at the time, the confession could not be used against him. Eventually, Speck stated that he was on drugs and alcohol and could not remember anything that happened that evening. Later, one of the state prosecutors stated that although they knew of the confession, because of Corazon Amaral as the state star witness, they didn't need the confession. With all the evidence they needed, the trial of Richard Speck began on April 3, 1967, with the star witness, Amaral, dramatically identifying Speck as the man who murdered her friends. When the prosecution asked Amaral to identify the man she saw that July 13th evening and the morning of the 14th, she, quote, rose from her seat in the witness box, walked directly in front of Speck, and pointed her finger at him, nearly touching him and said, this is the man. Lieutenant Emil Geis, the fingerprint expert for the Chicago Police Department, then testified as to the authenticity of the fingerprints found at the scene compared to Speck's fingerprints. The state believed with this evidence and Amaral's testimony that Speck murdered and brutalized the nurses. On April 15th, after Judge Herbert J. Passion charged the jury, they deliberated for approximately 49 minutes and found Speck guilty on eight counts of murder and strongly recommended the death penalty be imposed as punishment. Because of the imposition of the death penalty, an automatic appeal taken, the Illinois Supreme Court upheld Speck's conviction in November of 1968. On June 28, 1971, the United States Supreme Court upheld Speck's conviction but overturned the death sentence. On June 29, 1972, the U.S. Supreme Court declared the death penalty unconstitutional, so the Illinois Supreme Court's only option was to resentence Speck to life imprisonment. On November 21, 1972, Judge Richard Fitzgerald resentenced Speck to 400 to 1,200 years in prison eight consecutive sentences of 50 to 100 years. When he appeared before the parole hearing in 1976, the board denied Speck's request in seven minutes. The pardon board then denied Speck parole six more times after that. Speck began his incarceration at the Stateville Correctional Center in Crest Hill, Illinois. He gained a reputation as the, quote, Birdman, end quote, after he kept a pair of sparrows that flew into his cell. But the warden often described him as a, quote, big nothing doing time, end quote. Speck never gained a reputation as a model prisoner either, often being caught with drugs or moonshine alcohol. Speck scoffed at the punishment when he stated, quote, 
How am I going to get in any trouble? I'm here for 1,200 years. End quote. In the only interview he gave to Bob Green in 1978 for the Chicago Tribune, he finally confessed to the murders. Speck stated that one of his biggest pleasures in prison was getting high. The convicted murderer stated that he did not expect to be in prison past the year 2000, where, after his release, he planned to run a grocery store. In his final quote to the newspaper, Speck stated that he had a message for the American people. Just tell them to keep up their hatred for me. I know it keeps up morale, and I don't know what I would do without it. On April 23, 1973, the Santa Cruz Police Department received a telephone call from what appeared to be a payphone. The man, a 24-year-old, spoke on the telephone from Pueblo, Colorado and confessed that he had just committed a double homicide four days earlier. The young man on the phone related that he killed his mother, Clarnell Strandberg, on Good Friday. Subsequent to murdering his mother, the young man went out and drank with some cop friends and when he returned to his mother's residence, he invited her friend Sarah Sally Hallett over for dinner and a movie. When Hallett arrived at the residence, he murdered her too. The caller admitted that he removed Hallett's head and stuffed the bodies in closets located at his mother's residence on Ord Drive. The caller also related that when he left the house, he drove for days, dropped off one car, rented another, a green Chevy Impala, and then seriously contemplated turning himself into authorities. In the conversation with the mysterious man, law enforcement listed he confessed to over half a dozen murders that police had still not solved. The caller requested that someone come and pick him up as he had over 200 rounds of ammunition in the car and that the cash frightened him. The first officer that took the call believed it to be a prank and refused to take the call seriously. The officer suggested that the caller try back again later, but when he did, the officer had a difficult time believing the man's story. The caller continued to call several more times after that, until finally he spoke to Officer Jim Connor, who knew the caller and convinced an officer to go check out his mother's house. When junior detective Michael Aloofy arrived at the house and entered it, he immediately noticed the stench of decomposition. When he went to the part of the house where the caller stated he would find the bodies of his mother and her friend, Detective Luffy opened the door to the closet and saw a collection of blood and hair. He thereafter cordoned off the area and summoned the coroner, crime scene technicians, and other homicide detectives. The detectives and the coroner found the bodies of the two women, exactly as the caller described over the telephone. Both the women had been decapitated, with the caller's mother's head, Clarnell Strandberg, having been placed on the mantle and used as a target for darts. Her tongue and larynx had been placed in the garbage disposal, which spit them back out into the sink. What investigators were drawn to happened to be the discovery of a bloody serial killer who lingered beneath the noses of the local police department. This murderer frequented a bar where most off-duty policemen in the area frequented as well. The policemen knew the identity of this killer because they drank with him and discussed aspects of the case that now came to light. The young man who had made the call and later would become the subject of an intense investigation was none other than Edmund Emil Ed Kemper III. Kemper had a long history of mental illness and had committed his first murder as a teenager and what some would say was a justifiable homicide of his mother when his upbringing faced closer scrutiny. Ed Kemper was born in Burbank, California on December 18, 1948. Ed was the second child of Edmund Emil Kemper Jr. and Clarnell Kemper. Ed had a sister six years older and a sister two and a half years younger than he was. When Kemper reached nine years old, his father divorced his mother and she moved with the children to Montana. 
This move proved difficult for Kemper, as he grew very close to his father before the divorce. And once they arrived in Montana, Clarnell locked her son in the basement of the house any chance she could in an attempt to toughen him up, so to speak. But in later interviews, Kemper gave other reasons for his mother's zeal to incarcerate him within the house. Kemper believed that his existence was a prickly reminder to his mother. Kemper hated his mother, but in interviews, he has also stated that he loved her as well. He stated as saying, I still love my mother, and it's hard for someone to comprehend that you murder your mother through love. It isn't a rational process. It's a very painful process, and it isn't rational, and I gotta still live with that. Kemper somewhat understood his mother's motives and behavior, but he still experienced a great deal of misery and anger against her, and often envisioned things he would do to her. Although his life at home deteriorated the older he became, Kemper managed to present a pleasant facade in public where people saw that even though he stood six foot nine and weighed over 280 pounds, people granted him a certain modicum of trust. Even though he acted quite docile in front of others, deep inside of Kemper's psyche, he developed perverse and demented fantasies. At a young age, approximately 10 years old, Kemper began thinking of females through sexual fantasies. His inner world soon reeked of violence, depravity, and morbidity. After imagining what he would do to his mother for her treatment of him, at the age of 13, Kemper began his morbid career when he murdered the family cat. This, Kemper later recalled, brought him a sense of empowerment, especially when he made an altar and placed the cat's decapitated head upon it. Also at this age, Kemper ran away from home to go live with his father, a life he thought sure would be better than living with his mother. But when he arrived at his father's residence, he discovered that his father had remarried and had had another son with his new wife. Needless to say, his father was not as happy to see him as much as Kemper would have thought. Although Edmund M. L. Kemper Jr. welcomed his son for a while, he soon sent Kemper back to his mother to live. Unable to deal with such an overgrown adolescent, and also planning to remarry her third husband, Clarnell sent her son to live with her parents in California. Later, Kemper stated that his father actually sent him to the grandparents to live with the intention of writing all the bad things his mother did to him. It seemed that Kemper became a sick pawn in a game of who's the better role model within the family. On August 27, 1964, 15-year-old Kemper lived with his paternal grandparents on their 17-acre ranch in North Fork, California. At this time, Kemper's rage boiled within him, thinking that he had somehow become the black sheep of the Kemper clan. Already standing six foot four at his young age, Kemper presented an imposing figure on anyone that met him. He hated how his mother treated him, and his grandmother proved almost as difficult. It was here that his darkest fantasies took shape, as he grew tired of his grandmother also telling him what to do and when to do it. Kemper later recounted how he used to fantasize about killing his grandparents and the rest of the world to be more specific. He wanted to rid the world of the people that had emasculated him. As he and his grandmother Maud sat in the kitchen going over proofs for a children's book that Maud had written, when she looked at her grandson she noticed an odd yet diabolical look on his face. Kemper then grabbed a loaded rifle and told his grandmother that he was going outside to shoot some gophers. When his grandmother sternly warned him not to shoot birds, Kemper then walked outside the kitchen area, slamming the screen door behind him. When he got to the last step outside the door, he turned and noticing her back to him, Kemper took aim with the rifle. He fired one shot, hitting her in the head and killed her outright. He then placed two more shots in her back then grabbed a knife and stabbed her repeatedly. When he returned to the inside of the house, Kemper wrapped her head in a towel and then dragged her corpse into her bedroom. As he situated his grandmother's body, he heard his grandfather's vehicle coming up the driveway. When Edmund Kemper Sr. arrived home after purchasing some groceries, Kemper took aim at the old man's head and pulled the trigger, also killing him outright. After these murders, Kemper became scared and wondered what to do with the bodies of his grandparents. Certainly they would be missed by family and friends, so he called his mother and she instructed him to call the local sheriff. 
When law enforcement arrived, they took Kemper to the station where he promptly confessed to the murders of his grandparents, stating that he often fantasized about murdering his grandmother, but only murdered his grandfather as an act of mercy to keep him from having to see his dead wife and possibly die of a heart attack. As a result of his confession, California officials confined Kemper to the California Youth Facility until they could figure out what to do with him. Subsequently, a psychiatrist evaluated the young murderer and determined that he was paranoid and psychotic. Thereafter, the court confined Kemper to the Atescadero State Hospital on December 6, 1964, just two weeks shy of his 16th birthday. At Atescadero, it was not like a prison. There were no guard towers, and when Kemper arrived, the staff subjected him to a number of tests, and then he began to gain some insight as to why he killed. Kemper did not accept responsibility for his crimes, and believed that something else controlled him at the time of the commission of those crimes. Kemper participated in the training of assisting the staff at the institution into administering tests to other inmates. Normally, sociopaths, as determined through his tests as well, are not too eager to please anyone, much less perform a given task with the vision of being praised for competence. Kemper, on the other hand, wanted to please his administrators. Whether this served as a ploy for him to gain early release or not, Kemper showed concern for the tasks given to him by the staff of the hospital. Despite his model patient demeanor, Kemper's incarceration at a Tescadero State Hospital was a very detrimental and harmful environment for a young teenage boy to be immersed in. Dr. William Schanberger, one of the facility's staff, has stated in interviews, In those days we had 1,600 patients in the hospital, several dozen who had committed murder, and 800 mentally disordered sex offenders, and a psychology staff of only 10 people or so. While in a Tescadero, Kemper conversed with teenage serial rapists, and in lengthy discourse with these boys, he developed a productivity toward domination and violence, some of the facets that emerged when he committed later crimes. Kemper made mental notes that some of these rapists got caught due to their sloppiness in committing the crimes. They left the witnesses and overt evidence. They attacked women they already knew or acquainted, and they committed their crimes in places that were too public. Although Kemper maintained this information for further reference, he never informed therapists or psychiatrists that he actually had these types of violent fantasies. During the time of his incarceration, many believe that Kemper fashioned a plateaued religious conversion to trick the administrators and the court to release him from a Tescadero. Viewed as clean-cut and conservative, intelligent and somewhat naive, Kemper saw his release in 1969 but it had been five years since his incarceration began, and assuredly the outside world changed rather abruptly for Kemper. Upon his release, Kemper started attending a local community college with an eye towards becoming a police officer, but while he attended the college, the youth authority still maintained supervision over him. Although Kemper dreamed of himself to become a police officer, with minimum height requirements, they also had maximum height requirements, of which Kemper exceeded. Because he faced the rejection from becoming a police officer, Kemper bought a motorcycle, which made him feel like a law enforcement officer. Kemper exceeded at his studies, and the state of California paroled him for another 18 months. Against the advice of the doctors at Atescadero that Kemper not return to the sponsorship of his mother, who by now had moved to Santa Cruz, California, and had again been married and divorced, the youth authority did exactly that. When Kemper returned to his mother's residence, the fighting and arguments soon began again. Clarnell harangued Kemper in such trivial matters as to whether to get his teeth cleaned or not. The constant nagging and belittlement made for an explosive atmosphere. Still fascinated with law enforcement work, Kemper sought solace at a local bar called the Jury Room. The lounge became a main hangout for local cops in the area, and Kemper sat drinking and listening to tales of the crime world through the eyes of these lawmen. Kemper showed respect to the officers who called him Big Ed. After wondering what was in store for his future, 
Kemper worked various labor jobs until finally he took a job with the California Division of Highways, which gave him the freedom to save some money and to move from his mother's house into an apartment in Alameda, California. Even though he no longer stayed under the same roof as his tormentor, Clarnell still berated her son whenever the chance arose. While riding his motorcycle, Kemper actually wrecked it twice, and the second time he badly broke his arm. The Division of Highways gave him time off to recover after this second accident, and with an out-of-court settlement from that mishap, he purchased a vehicle that resembled an unmarked police car. With this vehicle, Kemper equipped the car with a radio, an antenna, and a microphone to make outward appearances seem him to be a law enforcement officer. With this vehicle, Kemper picked up hitchhikers and brought them to their destinations unharmed. He learned during the course of these actions how to gain their trust. Privately, Kemper acted out his violent fantasies as to what he would do with the captive hitchhikers once he got them into the vehicle. Thereafter, Kemper further equipped his car to fulfill those fantasies within the future. He rigged the passenger side door, preventing it from opening from the inside. The antenna came off the vehicle and placed plastic bags, knives, guns, and a blanket. For over a year, Kemper experimented until the right time when he could finally encompass himself in the fantasies. On May 7, 1972, that circumstance presented itself. Two young girls, Marianne Pesci and Anita Lucesa, attended Fresno State College and hitchhiked to Stanford University after spending a few days at Berkeley, California. Kemper felt that this incident was the right time. Soon after picking up the two young girls, he drove around a bit and finally pulled off to a secluded spot and pulled a pistol from under his seat. Kemper put Anita into the trunk and then concentrated on Marianne. Kemper handcuffed the terrified young woman, laid out in the back seat, put a plastic bag over her head and tried to strangle her with a piece of terry cloth. But the young woman, fighting for her life, bit through the plastic bag and the cloth suddenly snapped. Always the planner, Kemper took out a knife and began stabbing the young woman to death, finally just slashing her throat. Kemper then removed Anita from the trunk and with a larger knife began stabbing her as well. Anita fought and screamed, but Kemper eventually subdued her. After murdering the two young women, Kemper drove around in his car trying to decide what to do with their bodies. Kemper finally decided to bring Marianne's body to his apartment. Kemper undressed the body and systematically dissected her remains. He then decapitated Anita's body. Subsequently, Kemper buried Marianne in the plastic bag that she bit through while Kemper tried to murder her. Later, after his arrest, Kemper led police to Marianne's burial site. He kept the heads of the two girls for a long time, eventually throwing them into a ravine. Marianne's body would later be identified, but Anita's body, nor her head, would ever be found. Because of his quote-unquote square demeanor, no one would ever suspect Kemper of two brutal murders. Therefore, he continued to hunt. On the evening of September 14, 1972, Aiko Ku, a 15-year-old dancer of Korean descent, grew tired of waiting for a bus to her dance class and decided to hitchhike. Kemper happened by and picked her up. A few minutes passed in idle conversation, and then Kemper brandished a pistol in front of Aiko. When he said he was thinking about using the weapon on himself, Aiko caught on and knew he had no intention of killing himself. Kemper convinced her that he was not going to use the weapon on her either, but if she alerted anyone, he would kill her. Kemper then drove to the base of a mountain range and turned the vehicle onto a deserted path. Kemper then placed tape over her mouth and began suffocating her by placing his fingers in her nose and mouth. Aiku merely passed out, but when she regained consciousness, Kemper then tried the suffocation technique again and didn't stop until she quit breathing completely. Kemper then removed Aiku from the car and placed her lifeless body on the ground and raped her. He took her scarf and completed his suffocation of the 15-year-old. When he finished, Kemper placed her body in the trunk and drove away from the scene. Kemper made his way to a local bar and had a few beers before heading home. When he arrived at his residence, 
Kemper opened the trunk frequently to admire what he called his conquest. Later, when night fell, Kemper took Aiku's body and placed it upon his bed, dissecting parts from her corpse and then finally decapitating her. Subsequently, he deposited the various parts in different locations, and to this day, Aiko Ku's total remains have never been located. On January 8, 1973, Kemper purchased a 22 caliber revolver. He was not supposed to have or even be able to purchase it due to his previous crime and record. But Kemper had no problems with the purchase at all. At this point, his hunting intensified. On the same day as he purchased the revolver, Kemper picked up Cindy Shaw and drove into the woods near Watsonville, California, where he forced the young girl into the trunk of his car and shot her using his new firearm. Just prior to this assault, Kemper had moved back into his mother's house, so he brought Cindy's body back to the duplex where he presently lived, and when his mother left for work the following morning, Kemper had sex with Shaw's corpse. Painstakingly, Kemper dissected Cindy Shaw's corpse, paying close attention to taking the bullet out of her skull, disposing of that evidence, and then taking the dismembered parts of her body and throwing them over a cliff. Cindy Shaw's body had been discovered 24 hours after Kemper dismembered her, but he exhibited no fear of apprehension. On the night of February 5th, 1973, Kemper and Clarnell had one of their monumental arguments and Kemper stormed out of the apartment, hyped, excited, and ready to kill. Driving around, he spotted Rosalind Thorpe, hitchhiking, and decided to pick her up. For a short period of time, Kemper made small talk with Rosalind, and then picked up another young woman a few minutes later, Alice Liu. Kemper exhibited no hesitation when it came to having both women in his car, as there was a parking decal from the University of California, Santa Cruz, displayed prominently on the passenger side front windshield. Clarnell, his mother, had obtained the decal because she was employed by the university and worked on campus as an administrator. He figured that someone who may have portrayed himself as a hard-working student could not be that bad. Kimber drove for a short distance down the highway and drew Rosalind's attention toward the view of the passenger window. He then took out his twenty-two revolver and shot her in the back of the head, as she admired the scenery at night. Kemper then turned toward the back seat and fired several rounds into Alice Liu, who didn't appear to die as quickly as Rosalind. Kemper waited until he got out of town to administer the coup de grace, finishing Alice off with an additional shot to the head. After pulling into a cul-de-sac, Kemper quickly placed their bodies into the trunk and drove to a local gas station. From the gas station, he returned to his mother's apartment and quickly left again, claiming he needed cigarettes. When he left the apartment, Kemper went out to the car and decapitated the two bodies he had in the trunk. The next morning, he brought Alice's body into his room and had sex with it. He also removed the bullet from Rosalind. The killer then disposed of the body parts in the Pacific Ocean. Clarnell Strandberg never gave any indication that she knew as to her son's nocturnal activities. However, after murdering Rosalind Thorpe and Alice Liu, Kemper decided that it was time to finally eliminate his mother. On April 21, 1973, Kemper heard his mother return home after a night out partying with her friends. When he went into Clarnell's room, she stated to him, Well, I suppose you want to talk now. Kemper shook his head and went to his room. He waited patiently there until approximately 5.15 a.m., when he went to the kitchen and retrieved a claw hammer. He walked into his mother's bedroom where she lay sleeping peacefully. Kemper raised his arm with the implement and struck his mother hard on the head. He finished off by slashing her throat. It is said that Kemper murdered and then decapitated his mother within a minute of the initial blow to her head. He then commenced to cutting out her larynx at the same time. The assailant then tried to stuff the tissue down the garbage disposal, but it only spit the tissue back up. He placed her head on the mantle and began speaking to her, telling her all the things she had done wrong with him. Kemper also threw darts for the first time, using his mother's decapitated head as a target. He then hid his mother's body in a closet, then soon left the apartment. In a later interview, Kemper found it hard to talk about the death of his mother, 
as her death was the result of the way she raised him. As he drove around that afternoon trying to decide what to do next, Kemper decided that if someone else were found with his mother's body, then suspicion would be cast away from his direction. Kemper got on the telephone and called Sarah Hallett, a friend of Clarnell's. At first, Kemper could not get in touch with her, and he teetered on the verge of panic until Sarah called later that afternoon, and he invited her over for dinner as a surprise for his mother. Sarah willingly accepted, and when she arrived at the apartment, Kemper strangled her with his bare hands at first, and then used the scarf that he got from Aiko Ku to finish the job. After strangling Sarah to death, Kemper undressed the body, laid it on his bed, and attempted to have sex with her. He stayed the whole night in the apartment with the corpses of his mother and her friend with blood strewn all over the place. On the following morning, Kemper left town driving east in Sarah's car, listening to the radio and perhaps hoping someone had gone to his mother's apartment and found the two corpses, but no announcement came over the airwaves. Scared that he may be detected, he rented another car and then left Sarah's vehicle at a local gas station, telling the attendant that it was in need of some repair. The killer then drove for 18 hours, only stopping for gas, soda, and no dose, a caffeine compound promoted to keep those taking the pills awake. Kemper finally arrived in Pueblo, Colorado, and decided to turn himself in, although, as earlier documentation suggests, the police in Santa Cruz did not believe him at first. Subsequent to be taken into custody, Santa Cruz detectives immediately went to Pueblo, Colorado, where they questioned Kemper for hours as to the crimes he claimed to have committed. The killer gave very explicit details to the crimes he perpetuated and bestowed upon the investigators a very precise confession to the eight murders he committed in or near Santa Cruz, California. When law enforcement authorities returned Ed Kemper back to Santa Cruz, he showed them the places where he dumped the bodies and body parts, all the while continuing to confess. When Kemper finished explaining everything to police, his court-appointed attorney, Jim Jackson, could find no other defense other than insanity. Finally, on May 7, 1973, Santa Cruz County indicted Kemper on eight counts of first-degree murder. Several witnesses stepped forward at his trial to avert that Kemper was not capable of such violence, but the prosecutor at the time torpedoed the witnesses brought before the court. One prosecution witness, Dr. Joel Fort, testified that he reviewed Kemper's case file extensively, even going back as far as when mental health professionals examined the youth after he murdered his grandparents. Dr. Fort also interviewed Kemper, and the assailant revealed to the psychiatrist details about his sexual practices, and even that Kemper practiced a demented form of cannibalism. Dr. Fort theorized that Kemper exhibited no symptoms or behavior that would classify him as a paranoid schizophrenic. Kemper was obsessed with violence and sex, craved attention, even to the point of slashing his wrists with a ballpoint pen during his trial. In fact, Kemper tried twice to kill himself during the trial. If, and only if, Dr. Ford emphatically stated that if Kemper received freedom again, he would definitely kill and kill the same sort of victims as he had in 1972 and 1973. One defense psychiatrist testified that Kemper was insane based on the product standard, which allowed for someone to say that the crime is the product of a diseased mind, but this was not within the state's definition. During the trial, not one witness produced by the defense could sway the jury that Kemper actually was insane. A little aberrant, but not insane. On November 1st, 1973, Emin Kemper took the stand in his own defense. He tried to convince the jury that his need to possess a woman and the practice of necrophilia meant that he did exhibit symptoms of insanity. Kemper also testified that he felt some remorse for the killings, but that he took to drinking more alcohol, and that may have contributed to his carefree attitude when it came to the murders he committed. But Kemper also described the sexual ecstasy he experienced when he removed the victim's heads. Killing appeared to be a narcotic to this merciless killer. 
The defendant tried to emphasize on the stand that he had two personalities, one which was normal and the other of a killer personality when activated. After a three-week trial on November 8, 1973, the six-man, six-woman jury deliberated for over five hours before finding Kemper sane and guilty of eight counts of first-degree murder. The whole time when Kemper believed the jury would find him guilty, he hoped for a sentence of death. But in late 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court placed a moratorium on the death sentence and therefore received eight consecutive life sentences. The death penalty became applicable only to crimes committed after January 1, 1974. When the judge asked Ed Kemper what he thought his punishment should be at the time, Kemper responded that he should be tortured to death. The judge obviously would not grant such a draconian request. Instead, the jurist sent Kemper first to the California Medical Facility State Prison at Vacaville, California, north of San Francisco for observation, but later transferred to the California State Prison at Folsom. During his early incarceration, Kemper requested that some form of psychosurgery be performed on his brain to alleviate any violent or aggressive sexual urges. Of course, this request was denied by prison authorities, believing that then, post-surgery, Kemper would petition the courts for his release back into society. When he arrived at Folsom, Kemper became the model prisoner by reading books on tape for the blind, but when he went before the parole board for the first hearing, he told the board that he did not believe himself fit to be released back into society. Thereafter, prison officials reported that Kemper was kind, cooperative, and gentle, but that he did not want to forget what he had done in the past. Kemper also granted requests to people who interviewed him, although later he became agitated at what some interviewers said about him. In the early years of the Behavioral Sciences Unit of the FBI, agents Robert Ressler and John Douglas sought to understand why serial and mass killers committed the crimes in the manners in which they did. They also sought to discover how these assailants planned and executed their assaults, what they thought about after they committed the offenses, what types of fantasies drove them to these acts, and what they thought in between the attacks. Eben Kemper was one of 36 inmates with serious offenses, such as serial murder, who agreed to be interviewed by the agents. Robert Ressler began his series with Kemper in accompanying Douglas and other agents twice before his solitary interview with Kemper. Ressler believed that in previous interviews he established a rapport with Kemper and therefore had nothing to fear from the giant murderer. On their third interview, Ressler sensed something amiss and pressed the button in the small cell near death row in Folsom where he had spoke to Kemper. When he pressed the button, nothing happened. No guard appeared. From that point forward, Ressler had to mentally spar with Kemper in order to buy some time. Kemper then stated, If I went a in here, you'd be in a lot of trouble, wouldn't you? I could screw your head off and place it on the table to greet the guard. After the guard finally made it to the cell, Ressler walked out, unscathed and relieved. Kemper later stated that he was just joking. Ressler never interviewed Kemper alone again. Ressler and Douglas's assessment of Kemper was that he was one of the most intelligent inmates they interviewed. At first, Kemper appeared aloof and often played word games with them. But then realizing that all the agents wanted to accomplish was to understand how he quote-unquote ticked, he then became very open with them. Open, at least, until the agents began questioning the serial killer about his mother and her treatment of him. Kemper claimed that his mother made him sleep in a windowless basement, damp, dark, and isolated, because Kemper looked like his father, or so the murderer believed. His mother took her frustrations out on him. Furthermore, Clarnell made him sleep in the basement because of her fear that Kemper would molest his sisters. The interviewee believed that at this time his hatred of women festered and grew as his mother made him feel dangerous and shameful, so he killed the two family cats. Because Kemper became very studious in prison, 
Douglas pointed out that he knew all the psychological buzzwords when he described his behavior. As a result of these interviews, with Kemper and others, the Behavioral Sciences Unit matured, and therefore our understanding of what can be called murder psychology is an integral element in determining when a killer may strike, victimology, and the meanings behind their behavior, and how they treat their victims. A war hero and contemporary of Joan of Arc, Gilles de Montmorency Leval, later known to history as Gilles de Ray, was born in 1405 into one of the wealthiest families in all of France. By the time Laval had been born, the Hundred Years' War had been going on for the last 60 years and would continue for almost 50 more. Gilles' mother and father, Guy de Ray, and mother Marie de Crayon, married as a result of an arrangement between their parents to avoid a vendetta of sorts. The Dorés had two children, Gilles and his brother René. Doré became very proficient in academics and the martial doctrine so prevalent with young boys at the time. Several tragedies occurred in Gilles' young life that would characterize his later personality. During the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, Doré's family suffered a loss when his uncle was slaughtered as a prisoner of war for the English. Later that year, his mother and father died simultaneously, his mother of alleged natural causes and his father in a boar hunting accident. At the age of 14, Doré was squired out to a local nobleman to learn the ways of being a medieval knight. His grandfather, Jean de Créon, arranged for Dere to be married relatively early to a girl who was only four at the time of the betrothal. Jean de Créon, an always reticent man who saw making his family more rich and powerful, believed the union to be beneficial to him and his family. However, the French Parliament would not allow the marriage to take place due to the fact that the union would bring untold riches to the de Créon family. Instead, Jean de Créon ordered his grandson to kidnap a young lady named Catherine de Tura, Doré's cousin, who was the heir to a large amount of land next to the Doré estates. Catherine felt compelled to marry Doré, and the two had one child together, a daughter. This marriage made the Doré family very wealthy indeed. In English and French history, this time period proved to be the most volatile. Charles VI, King of France, was insane, and his son, also named Charles, ruled France in his steed. Known as the Dauphin, being the heir to the throne, faced a rival claim to the French throne from Henry V, King of England. This claim proved dangerous for the two powers, as this was the main point of contention between the English and French and caused the One Hundred Years' War. Duray fought for the Dauphin in these conflicts and distinguished himself very bravely. Quote, almost to the point of recklessness, but skilled enough to turn that bravery into victory." End quote. When Dere turned 25 at the court of the French king, a young lady entered and stated that God sent her to the king in order to defeat his enemies. The young girl asked King Charles VII to give her an army to command and she would relieve the beleaguered city of Orléans, liberate the city, and deliver the crown to the king. The king knew that if the city fell, he would be defeated. And so, with nothing to lose, Charles VII granted the young girl's request. Joan of Arc stood at the head of a demoralized army with de Ray as her advisor and marched to Orléans to meet the English. What started as a doubtful venture, Joan of Arc delivered victory after victory to Charles VII. Because of his successes, the king awarded de Ray with the title of Maréchal de France. Even though de Ray exhibited an overwhelming prowess when it came to military matters, politically he was a novice and clearly outmatched at court. The power of his marshalship was never exerted to its full potential, and in 1431, when the English captured Joan of Arc and held her for ransom, de Ray was powerless to help her. Of course, the English burned her at the stake as a heretic. 
For the medieval knight, status was everything, and the inability to assist his commander Joan of Arc in her hour of need, DeLay faced another serious blow to his integrity when his maternal grandfather passed away and left his sword and coat of arms to DeLay's younger brother, René. Between 1431 and 1435, the culmination of all these blows to his honor obviously had an effect on de Rey, as about this same time he withdrew from military and public life. This is when historians surmised de Rey began to murder children. The series began when de Rey's cousin, Gilles de Sille, hired a young apprentice to deliver a message. The young boy failed to arrive at his destination with the message, so Gilles de Sille surmised that the young man may have fallen victim to highwaymen. Furthermore, de Rey concerned himself with the building of a chapel where he presided over masses in dressings of his own design. He also dabbled in playwriting and produced a work that almost made him bankrupt. He began selling properties and, at first, people observing the events determined that de Rey may have had an ulterior motive for doing so. De Rey's family became concerned that the knight was spending through the de Créon wealth and appealed to Charles VII to step in and keep de Rey from selling all the land and squandering the money. The king issued an edict that forbid anyone to buy any more property from the knight, nor were any of the subjects to enter into a contract with him. However, de Rey and the family fled to Brittany where the king's edict had no effect. Once de Rey made it to his destination, he sent out word that he wanted to speak with persons who knew anything about alchemy and demon summoning. Through a local priest, Eustache Blanchet and Francois Prelati, de Rey sent the men out to find individuals who had great knowledge of the quote, dark arts, end quote. When the religious clerics returned, de Rey held a plethora of ancient and forbidden knowledge. Armed with this knowledge, de Rey began experiments where he attempted to summon a demon named Baron in the main hall of his castle at Tiforge. After several attempts, a demon failed to materialize. Prelati suggested to de Rey that Baron appeared to be angry and required that de Rey provide the demon with the sacrifice of body parts from children. In a few of the ceremonies, de Rey offered these pieces in a glass vessel, but again, to no avail. The demon failed to appear. Frustrated with his failures and almost broke because of this venture, de Rey set a course for the weird and tragic. He began murdering young children between 1432 and 1433, but because of the ravages of time, no record of these first homicides exists. However, when de Rey later gave a confession as to the murders he did commit, he included the first ones along with his morbid tally. After committing some homicides in Chanteuse sur Loire, de Rey made his way to Mouchecou. De Rey murdered or ordered to be murdered a great number of children after, it has been said, he sodomized them first. Subsequently, 40 naked bodies of children had been discovered in Mouchecou in 1437. One of the first documented cases of child abduction in this case occurred when a 12-year-old boy named Judon was engaged to deliver a message to Mouchacou and failed to return. No one knew where the young adolescent may have gone to. According to sources regarding Gilles de Rey, the method of the many murders had been documented as thus. The boy was pampered and then dressed in better clothes than he had ever known. The evening began with a large meal and heavy drinking, particularly Hippocras, which acted as a stimulant. The boy was then taken to an upper room to which only he and de Rey in his immediate circle were admitted. There he was confronted with the true nature of his situation. The shock thus produced on the boy was an initial source of pleasure for Guille. De Rey employed a body servant known as Etienne Corillo, also known as Poitou, who acted as an accomplice to his night master. During de Rey's trial, Poitou later testified that de Rey stripped the young boys naked, hanged them with ropes from a hook to prevent the victim from crying for help, then, quote, masturbated upon the child's belly or thighs, end quote. Then de Rey would cut the child down, provided some short period of comfort, then would kill the child by decapitation, cutting their throats, 
breaking their necks with a stick, and then dismembering them. According to the manservant, de Rey took, quote, infinitely more pleasure in debauching himself in this manner than in using their natural orifice in the normal manner, end quote. After their deaths, de Rey later admitted that he kissed them and then cut off the parts of their bodies that he most admired. De Rey then sat on their stomachs in the throes of their agony and watched them die. The parts of the bodies remaining were burned in the huge fireplace of the hall, with the clothes of the victims being placed over the body parts to minimize the smell. The ashes were deposited in a myriad of hiding places. On May 15, 1440, Delay kidnapped a local cleric during a dispute with the church of saint Etienne de mer Morte. Delay drew attention when the Bishop of Nantes decided to investigate the incident, during which time Delay's crimes became exposed. In the latter part of July in that year, the bishop issued his findings, and in September 1440, authorities arrested Delay, Poitou, and another manservant. Delay's case would be tried by both secular and ecclesiastical courts on the charges of murder, sodomy, and heresy. Even after overwhelming evidence given to the court by the eyewitnesses that convinced the judges of Delay's guilt, he confessed his crimes on October 21, 1440. Testimony given was said to be so lurid and grotesque, judges struck it from the record. In the end, Historians have ventured to guess that de Rey's victims ranged from between 80 and 200, and although his victims included those young people between the ages of 6 and 18, with members of both sexes, most of them were boys. On October 23, 1440, a secular court heard the confessions of Poitou and Henriette, the other manservant, and sentenced them to death. On October 26, 1440, at approximately 9 a.m., guards led de Rey and the two manservants in a procession to the Palace of Execution located on the Ile de Bies. De Rey requested to be executed first, and that request was granted. First being hanged, the executioners set the platform on fire. Before the flames could consume the body, executioners cut down de Rey's body and four women came forth to collect it for burial. The two manservants met the same fate, but their bodies were reduced to ashes and then scattered. Court authorities granted de Rey's final request to be buried on the church of the monastery located at Notre-Dame-de-Calmes in Nantes. After Gilles de Rey's conviction and execution, doubt surfaced as to whether the knight was truly guilty. Immediately after his execution, the prosecutor at the trial received all of de Rey's lands and wealth, dividing it amongst his own nobles. Additionally, some historians have made the argument that de Rey's prosecution and death were the result of a conspiracy against the Catholic Church or the French state. Some writers contend that de Rey was the victim of a French Inquisition. Historians now view Gilles de Rey as a, quote, lapsed Catholic who descended into crime and depravity, end quote. In 1992, a group of scholars, writers, and historians assembled to try de Rey again, based upon the records available regarding the trial. They found the embattled knight not guilty. However, none of them were medieval historians, nor did the so-called, quote, experts, end quote, turn to medieval historians for any advice. To this day, historians believe Gilles de Rey to be guilty of his crimes and can be classified as a medieval serial killer. If you enjoyed this marathon, please check out our other episodes and tell your friends and other true crime aficionados about us. They may not know we exist. Also, we would like some support from the viewers, so if you want to subscribe for a long time or just make a contribution, we have a PayPal account, and we are also on Subscribestar and Rumble. Also, if you want to follow us, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and I will leave the links below. Stay tuned for more episodes, and please forgive the sound effects. So don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Until next time.